You want to get strong in the real world? In other words, the kind of strength that transfers outside of the gym. Try this, offset loading. What's offset loading? Well, this is when you load your body in an unbalanced way. And no, I'm not talking about bouncy balls and stability balls and uh, weird dyna discs and stuff like that. That's not what I'm talking about. I mean, literally offset weight on your body, like a suitcase carry or a one-arm shoulder press holding a barbell, not a dumbbell. Why does this make you strong in the real world? Because nothing in the real world is perfectly balanced like a barbell. The energy and power leaks that you experience when you try to lift something limits your strength. So strengthen your body in a way to where it can exert power when you're offset. By the way, the old, wise, strong men of the past understood this. And let me tell you, they kicked the crap out of the average bodybuilder Ooh, today. This is a forgotten art. Why do, you, why do you think this fell out of favor? Because it's hard. Yes, <laughs> really no, hard. I just, that's, that's, to me, I'm, that's too easy of a yeah. default answer. It's like, there's a lot of hard stuff that we continue to do. There's risky. And, and, and the, like the things I think right, like right away, I think, especially having a kid, like carrying a kid like that, there's mm -hmm. so much value in, in training with loaded on one side like that, because that's how you'll always carry your kid. Yeah. You'll yeah. always carry your kid like on one hip or one side or. You're not going to hold him like this. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're not like perfectly bad. Like <laughs> nobody holds a kid like this, you yeah. know, like and the kid have, doesn't move. Yeah. So, so it's like, that's something that men and women have had to do our, our entire history. And so why, why would we lose that? And where would we, where would it disconnect? Like, oh, we no longer need to do that. See, I, I know the, I know the answer. Really? A, yes. hundred percent. I know the answer. I thought a lot about this. It's because we were, we began worshiping the symptom, uh, and the visual effects of strength mm. rather than the strength itself. Mm. Okay. If you go back, wow. uh, you go back I and now, get on board with that. I referred to the old wise you know, men and women of the past in the, in the strength world back then. And we're looking at the turn of the, of the century, right? Uh, you know, 1890s and then the early 1900s, how you looked was cool, but it was really about what you could do because yeah, yeah. the world revolved around what you could do. Now you go back before that, you go back a thousand years. Nobody gives, nobody cares how awesome you look. It's what you can do. Can you swing this heavy sword? Can you pick up this boulder? Can you do lots of work? You, and then the side effect of that was people who were able to do those things tended to look a particular way. And if you look at the contests in the strength world in the past, they all involved some type of function. And then they started to include a round where people actually showed off their bodies. And eventually it was the body showing off right. part that took over and everybody, you, nobody cared about this. You created think, this physical like uh, like specimen yes. just by doing these strength feats. That's right. Do you think like when uh, Eugene Sandow walked around with his shirt off at the pool back in the days, like that actually women didn't think it was attractive or yeah. wasn't into it? Oh no, so so Eugene, I'm so glad you brought him it, up. He's he's the perfect example of how, when this started to shift. Okay, so he yeah. so okay, so go before he was him, a bit then. later. Yes. Yeah. So give me a guy. I, we've looked at up to some. Obviously, we've looked up some of these old timey guys, right? And we've you've shown me people well before even Sandow that like actually I didn't realize how good some of their physiques looked. I remember when we first started. You first you brought all those books, and I started looking. I'm like, dude, there were some like badass physiques that didn't get highlighted. So my question is. Because it was such an anomaly back then, and it it, it, did, it wasn't you know praised or highlighted, did that guy take his shirt off at a pool and girls go, oh that's weird? You know what? Or, yeah, yeah, they did. I no, 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 it I, must be like that it initially, had to be, right? No, yeah, you're right. It's different. You're right. It was more of like a uh, an oddity. Yeah, like what's wrong with him? Yes, like he's uh, deformed or something. Like yeah, that, or there's something wrong with his metabolism <laughs> or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, so if you go back, right? First off, Eugene Sandow. Let's just talk about him for a second. This man, under 200 pounds. By the way, if you look at his body, uh, even by today's standards, he looked incredible. Yeah. He was lean. Well, he's the trophy. Muscular. He's the trophy from yeah. Mr. Olympia. Yeah. Um, he looked incredible. And, and the reason why he became famous was because he was one of the first strong men who looked a particular way, didn't just perform strength feats. So he was actually quite smart, and he would display his physique and also was able to perform. Whereas before that, it was really just about the performance. In fact... Eugene Sandow's records were beat by George Hackenschmidt mm. shortly afterwards. And, but why is Eugene Sandow known <coughs> more? Uh, because of, he posed and people saw his physique and they connected the two. And it was like, he was bringing it back to like the Greek, 
uh, ideals, right, with Greek statues and, and stuff like that that were kind of immortalizing like the beauty right. of. See, that's where I kind of think he was probably bringing back a bit of what uh, might have been known from statues and yes. things like that. Like, so yeah, it probably was odd initially, but I'm sure uh, you know, ladies went home that night later and just couldn't get it out of their head. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. it just it, it planted a seed. So, I don't, so, you know, I don't know. Like, so like, because there's like a lot of. I mean, you know, we've done we've done like surveys and stuff on women today, and the average woman, um, you know, when when you put like a shredded bodybuilder guy next to like kind of a dad bod, like the most women will actually pick that. Now that's today's society, and we've mm. been inundated with all these great looking bodies. So you have to ask yourself that if you go back even further. Well, I'll give you an example. Here's mm -hmm. an example right now. And this is to the women listening. And I guarantee you 90% of them will agree. And I think men know this as well. Imagine if you had uh, two men, okay, standing next to each other and you could see their bodies. One guy was like shredded and ripped and muscular. And the other guy just looked like a, I don't know, normally fit guy. Not unhealthy because that's different, right? You look unhealthy, then it sends a different signal. Just kind of a normal fit looking guy. If they're just standing there, I'm sure the average woman will be like, wow, look at that muscular, amazing physique. Now, imagine if both of them, with their shirts off and everything, went and go built something or had to chop some wood mm -hmm. or fight off some shit or who knows. And then you saw the other guy who's not as ripped and shredded in the way he moved and what he could do and how he could function. Yeah. And let's say the shredded, ripped looking guy couldn't do any of that stuff. 100% the women would stop finding that man attractive and would all of a sudden look at the guy that could do all the shit and be like, well, yep. that's way hotter. It's the physical feats. It's, yes. Yeah. The, it, I mean, it's it's undeniable when you see like a, a body that's built doing things that are really difficult and, um, you know, they're, they're really strong and powerful with it. It's kind of so hard to it's, So I agree with that. What the, the question I would have is like, how much is the disparity? You gave mm -hmm. an example of like the super shredded guy and the guy that looks average, but would that even work on the guy who like, kind of looks a little sloppy. You know what I'm saying? He's got a little belly on him. He doesn't look like he, but he's functional and he could lift the, he could lift the things and he could do the physical stuff. He could chop the wood. He could build the house and the other guys. I think it depends like, on the scenario. Like ripped, but metrosexual. I think dude. it depends on the scenario. <laughs> yeah. So let, I'll give you an extreme. You got a guy that looks kind of sloppy. Yeah. And then you got a guy that looks all shredded. Yeah. And then they're in a situation where they have to protect a bunch of people from, yeah, let's yeah. say like criminals. Yeah. yeah. And the shredded guy runs away and screams like a little baby. And the other guy throws down. Yeah. Yeah. He's way hotter immediately. And the other guy is not attractive whatsoever. By the way, the things that we tend to find attractive today, uh, really, if you look at the root, it, the root is in the capabilities that got you there. So like, for example, why right. do women find men uh, who are wealthy attractive? It's because it's evidence of his ability. Right, right. He can hunt. He can say. He can or just say, or just support right. and create and whatever. Like, well, yeah, that's today's what I meant by hunt. That's yes. like today's modern time yeah. of like being a hunter this killer, is, right? This is why a, a, a trust fund baby guy who's got tons of money but is a freaking spoiled brat is not attractive to a woman. Whereas a guy who's got less money but dude earned it himself, is confident, works for it, far more attractive. So the same thing goes with physique is that we look at bodies and we find them attractive. And nowadays, you don't have to test yourself as much. Things are safe. Guys don't have to do shit like they used to. Yeah. So really, all you have is the evidence of, of what how, they look like. How terrible are men, though? Nothing. That's not the same for us. What, what do you mean? Like, if you put that example of like- That yeah, is. No, it is not. Absolutely. You have you put a woman in front of two different women, and you know one of them is like completely out of shape and, and can go do whatever physical- feet No, do. not that. Not that. Uh, if you look at, if you have, because we've also distorted it, uh, in, in the other direction. So what we might find like hip to waist ratio, uh, fertility, okay, yeah, well, and then they go extreme in that direction. Okay, okay. Yeah. So that's, di that's different. Yeah. yeah but, okay. We don't go back to, I mean, we should, how is that the same for women? No way. It's no, it's not. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll give you a scenario. Yeah. Yeah. You got two women. Yeah. One of them looks perfect. The other yeah. one looks healthy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Again, why do we have to use this? That close of poor health is a really strong signal. So, okay. Well, don't say poor health. Just say kind of sloppy. Not like, like poor, like she don't look like she's ever touched a weight. Yeah. She, but she looks healthy. There's a difference. Okay. You can look like you don't work out, but look healthy. Okay. You could also look like you don't work out and look unhealthy. Okay. 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 So okay. fine. Doesn't look like they work out, but okay. doesn't look like, well, okay. that person's unhealthy yeah. versus like perfect. Yeah. Now watch them. Uh, now have them uh, care for you, care for your kids, uh, show 
compassion or do any of the things that men tend to value. So I disagree. And then the other one is like so I disagree. A gold digger stuck on herself. So I whatever. Dis I disagree. You, you see examples so? of that? Yeah, no, totally disagree. You'd be more attracted to the gold no, digger. No, no, you don't bring me into this. Yeah. I do because I've I've dated a lot of women, I've dated a lot of the wrong women and then I've figured out like that. Oh, you're secure. Right, I've figured that out. Yes, I'm right. referring to secure people. I'm talking oh, well, well that's it all the, goes hey, out the window. By the way, that's not most people. Nah, I know. <laughs> so I know. in the in the in a normal scenario yeah. like that uh, and we see examples all the time. I mean, how many rich dudes pick the girl who's just oh, yeah, yeah, just yeah. beautiful? Listen. She's not capable of doing hardly yeah, no, anything. No, no, you're right. You're right. Uh, let me let me back up. Uh I'm referring to secure people. When people are really insecure, okay, so, it all goes out the fucking Okay, yeah, window. but here's the thing, though. Because the, then the woman might want I, the dude I, I, that just looks good. No, I think even an insecure woman still makes that decision you made. I well, don't, I don't I, think security... That's why, this is, that's why the sexes are different here. This is where I think that... Let me use another example. An insecure woman might want the rich trust fund baby over the guy who makes a couple hundred grand a year who is an entrepreneur. Well, that's hard. still logical because he's, she still is going to get support she's still gonna get financial support she's if they still can both get... support her but one's super rich and the other one's like okay the insecure woman might be like i don't care i just want all the money is my point whereas like an insecure guy might be like i want the perfect looking uh gold digger you know girl that doesn't do anything else versus the one that okay doesn't look as good but is actually genuine caring so yeah when you're insecure that goes out all the window uh, just throw everything out the window i guess is what i'm trying to say i'm talking about secure healthy attraction is yeah. connected I mean, yeah, to those things. You're, I mean, I, I, your point is really good with, the, I think, the analogy. Of the I just think with men, men are so visual that, that that matters so much more. Unfortunately, it's not like, it's just that. that for sex or for, for uh, partnership? Mating, period. Oh, just mm -hmm. sex is different. Yeah, throw that out the window. So back uh, to the offset loading. Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, anyways, uh, attraction, that's a whole other uh, conversation. But um, yeah, I was thinking about that in terms of the structure of, of the gym and like how we've seen that completely evolve. So, you know, to as you can see, it, like most of it is now like based on kind of comfort, like single body part kind of focus, yep. like ways to be able to kind of pump your muscles up without having to, I guess, strain through and like really do these like difficult uh, offset loaded, like real functional type yeah. movements. So to give an example, back to Eugene Sandow, uh, here was a guy who under 200 pounds could do a one arm bent press, which is essentially lifting something in the air with one arm. Okay. There's a technique to it, but imagine somebody lifting something straight up in the air with one arm, 270 pounds. And it wasn't a dumbbell. It was a long barbell. <clears throat> so imagine how hard that is. So the strength is incredible. Now, uh, you, you, you know, you mentioned pumping up muscles and stuff like that. What kind of a body does that build? It builds a body that looks, and you know this when you see it, it looks strong in the real world. If you look at the physiques of these people, they had their core was incredibly built and strong, strong oblique, strong core. Very strong looking upper back, shoulders, hands and forearms, strong legs. They looked like they were stronger than the average person who was just as maybe ripped or whatever at the same body weight. Right. So it builds a tremendous physique and we're missing out. So even somebody listening right now who's like, I don't care about that uh, yeah. because I'm not going to have to do anything. You're missing out by doing stuff like uh, heavy loaded suitcase carry. Yeah. Or what, like, when's the last time somebody did an overhead one arm press, not with a dumbbell, with a barbell? Right. Like, so try lifting a barbell it's with it's one hard arm. hard to do this. Hella hard. hard. Yeah. What, what, what are we require? trading? What Especially are we trading? if you put plates on there. Yeah. Oh. Even if you do super light plates, it's hard to do that. I feel like, you know, what they used to build up, like, the, it was sort of its own check and balance because to be able to lift a heavy weight like that uh, unilaterally over your head. I mean, you have to have a, a pretty reinforced um, uh, system to be able to, to to sustain that and be able to keep your core nice and, and strong and, and supporting the, the spine and the, the hips. Yep. Today's giveaway is the MAPS Super Bundle. That's a lot of programs right there we're going to give away for free. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and then turn on your notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. We're also running a sale, the first sale, on MAPS Anabolic Advanced. That's our newer program. This one is by far the most effective muscle building program we have. This one will pack muscle and strength on your body in a hurry. It's incredible, and it's 50% off. If you're interested, click on the link at the top of the description below. 
All right, here comes the show. Do you do you think that when like the Ben Press, for example, do you think that was born out of like, oh, this is a good movement, or do you, this was the most functional way to get the most amount of weight above our head? That one, mm -hmm. and then it, and then it turned into Correct. an exercise. Yeah, like, so they, like the goal was get the heaviest weight above your head, and then this is the yes. best technique. And then, yeah, that, you know, it would be interesting to have watched the evolution be interesting of that. To see how they, yeah, how they like <laughs> you know, experimented was, their way to yeah. that <laughs> process. Yeah, because you know the first try wasn't that. You know? Yeah, well, even in the Ben Press, like you see, there's like super like crazy technique with that and like they're actually they've learned how to not um let it sort of stop here in the shoulder joint in terms of like the force they're able to learn how to distribute the force so if you get your obliques involved you get your back involved you get your hips involved all bigger muscles by all the way. bigger muscles now yeah. you have to contribute to stabilize the weight uh and then you can and then now like that lever is so much more effective yeah you know what's crazy about this too is that um when you what we don't a lot of us don't realize especially when we've been working out for a while that the limiter to our strength is has less to do with the exercise that we keep trying to get stronger in and more to do with the fact that there's a leak in power or there's an instability that we have yet to identify. So I'll use myself as an example. Uh, I love deadlifting. I'm good at deadlifting. It's the one lift that I can do that I can I feel real confident if I'm around other strong people. Well, I my deadlift went up because I did an exercise that I had no idea would contribute to my deadlift which was offloaded carries or offloaded overhead presses. Why? Well, if I break it down now as a trainer, there was probably an instability there laterally with my QL or one of my obliques or something like that. So I was practicing like these suitcase carries with a barbell, uh, which is really weird and awkward. Then I went to go do a deadlift and the weight came up. Mm -hmm. It just came up very smooth. It felt very different because uh, I had done something that my body needed uh, to be done that I couldn't really even break down knowing as much as I know with my own, my traditional methods. So like, what's my whole point with this? Like there's a lot of wisdom that we can learn from a lot of these exercises that are not popular anymore. That yeah. used to be very popular for a reason. Yeah. Well, we just don't do them. Yeah. You know what I, I mean? What I think of Im immediately is like, there was this need for mobility. There was this need for mm. that sort of supplemental movement to what we've created in terms of like the environment of the gym, the way that we train, there was definitely a deficit there. Uh, and, you know, using these kind of uh, unconventional lifts are the ones that were a little more uh, demanding in terms of functional strength. Uh, it, it covered all that. It strengthened all of those muscles to where you, you know, it, it really didn't require a lot of a lot of the mobility to address these things. Well, think a hundred years ago. Okay. There were no desk jobs. Every job yeah. was somewhat physically taxing and right. required mobility. And had, like, so it was so more, it was so much more common. I think that has a lot to do with why a lot of this fell out of favor too. It's just like, because we've now shifted to where the majority of jobs are not physical labor. Most jobs today are sitting at a, like, that just didn't even exist. So it's just like, I think real quickly, and then you add that to the like, oh, we care more just about aesthetics. So it's like, oh, what's the quickest way just to get to this aesthetically looking? Well, imagine if, um, uh, I'm going to use an analogy. Imagine if uh, uh, driving, nobody drove cars anymore. For whatever reason, we could float or whatever. We could just like like Star Trek, right? Pure, pure. But oh, I'd love but, to float. Yeah, no. But people still got cars, but nobody drove cars. It would very quickly move from what went inside the car to how the car looked. Nobody would give a shit about the engine if all you ever did was look at it, it was all about how it looked. So yeah. then we would do things to make it look fast. Mm. When, mm. In rea when in the past it was, okay, yeah. cool, that looks fast, but is it actually fast? Right. You know, it's funny, back back in the day, so what they used to do with these competitions, at the what they call the bronze era of, uh, of you know, these strength competitions, is people would show up and they would do these challenges. So it'd be like Eugene Sandow versus so-and-so, or so-and-so versus so-and-so. They would show up, they'd stand on a stage, and initially, I'm sure people would look at them and be like, wow, look how big that guy is. Or, oh my God, look at the whatever. Then they go right into the competition. Who can lift the most weight? Nobody gave a shit anymore. In fact, if you looked a lot bigger and stronger than the per than the other person and you lost, yeah. it was even more of an embarrassment and even bigger plus 
for the other person. There's sure. this guy called the, uh, I don't remember his name, the Mighty Adam. Yeah, the Mighty Adam. Yeah. He's either, he's either one, he's one of them had like a crazy- Bro, thing. he's this tiny dude. And yeah. he, he would like bend like, uh, you know, prison bars and do weird shit. Ch- and he was <laughs> famous because he was this little dude yeah. who was so strong. So- um, What is, okay, this may be a stupid question. What are all the uh, era, bronze, golden, what, and what- what exactly, how do they get their name? Like, why is it the bronze era? Why is it the golden era? So bronze, uh, I think what they're trying to do is like, um, you know how in, in with empires and the discovery yeah. of metals, it became like bronze was the first metal. It's almost like the tools they have to work with. Yeah. Like kind of relating to Yeah, I think that's what they came with. But anyway, bronze- Maybe would find that out. I'm curious. Bro- I mean, it would be it iron went, It went bronze point, but, and yeah. then silver. Silver would be, I think, 1940s. To early 60s. Oh, so there is a silver era? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so it went like bronze, then it went to like silver, maybe 1930, 1940s to 1960s, and then the golden era, which we all know of as being like the 70s and 80s. So what is now? Yeah. I don't know what they call it. Venice Beach. Yeah, I don't know what they refer to it now. (laughs) I didn't know there was a silver era. Platinum era. Yeah. Yeah. But when you hear golden era, like the golden era bodybuilding, they're talking about Arnold's era. Uh, Everybody refers to that as the golden era. Yeah. yeah. For sure. No, yeah, no. And that one I was more familiar with. I wasn't really familiar with even the bronze era until you guys started talking yeah. more about the old But you strong. could see the evolution of um, strength sports going from what you could do to what you could do and how you looked to just how you looked. Like nobody nobody cared. Like now mo- the most popular strength uh, sport or like bodybuilding, I should say. Nobody knows or cares about what they could do. It's all about how they look. Yeah. In the it, it, it was the opposite in the bronze era, and then it slowly moved into, yeah. You know, even in the silver era, they had competitions where bodybuilders would flex, but then they'd have to perform. <laughs> so like, right. No, I, I would feet. love to see that again. Honestly, uh, for the to incorporate more people, I think yes, the the. the physical specimen of what the body that you've built, but now like, let's see it in, in motion. Let's see what you can do uh, in terms of a functional strength. You know what? Social media has brought that back a little bit. Oh yeah. A little bit. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. yeah Cause you okay, watch, you follow your favorite bodybuilders and you love watching some like the, yeah. like the Ronnie Coleman thing was like a yeah. big deal. Right. Or right. some of them uh, uh, don't rank high in bodybuilding at all, but are well known more for their feet. Like Larry wheels. Larry Wheels mm-hmm. bodybuilder. Yeah. But he doesn't really do yeah, well he doesn't, have the, he doesn't have a great physique, but he's but strong as fuck. ridiculously strong, yeah, and he yeah. became well, uh, way more yeah, well-known. Yeah. Stad Efferding didn't really win lots of competitions in bodybuilding, yeah. but yeah. he was so strong. That's yeah. kind of how he Super built his strong. name. So yeah. what, what's the evolution look like? Do you think that, do you think we come back? Do we actually come back to this? Like, do we, do we get to a place where that is? you know, highlighted more and it is something that we, we That's care. a good question. I don't know. You know do yeah. we, does it come full circle? Is it a blend in the future? Like you're kind of alluding to, like, what does it look like? Or do we move into something yeah. completely different? I like that. It's a little bit of a blend. You know, we saw this with, with, um, with women too. Uh, CrossFit did this pretty well with women where, mm-hmm. um, all of a sudden, like strong women became, um, kind of cool again, but it wasn't because of how they looked. It was what they did. And then people said, Oh, they also kind of look good. CrossFit did that a little bit uh, for women. And you see with social media too now, women are celebrating more of like their lifts than before. Still not nearly as popular as, as how you look. Yeah. Same with thing with the man. Oh, I don't d- know where it goes. Doug's got the actual breakdown of the What years. does it say? So bronze is 1894 to 1939. Okay, there you go. Silver era is 1940 to 1959. Golden era is 1960 to 1983. What does that mean for you? Yeah, what is what is now? <laughs> That's what I wanted to know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it just stops there. How I guess. funny is that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how, lame, how lame is that? Like, everybody else sucks. Yeah. Uh, right. and, uh, oh, and, uh, man. It's pretty uh, wild. The exercise and the root workout routines change a lot, too, which is kind of interesting. If you look at the routines of the, you know, the, the bronze era versus the, you know, what sucks about this, by yeah. the way, uh, is that as we move through different, because bodybuilding still has a huge influence on um, how people work out. Okay. Although now we're seeing more influence from other other you know strength sports, which is pretty cool. But what sucks is as we move into new like phases, we f- we tend to have like lose the wisdom of the I previous know, ones. I know. Right. Instead of like compounding and being like, hey, let's not just throw everything out from bodybuilding. Yeah, let's, let's not add throw to everything. It. It's like exactly find a way to. No, it is so. It's so strange to me. Like I, I personally have never been like that. Like I'm, I'm generally curious about all these different modalities yeah. and like, oh, obviously there's a whole cohort of people that love this modality. There's got to be something there, right? Yeah. Even if it's something that does, I doesn't really appeal. To, like I'm not a big yoga guy, but I remember even like when 
being around yoga going like, well, there's got to be something really valuable here. For this, yeah. yeah, that many people. I got a great it. example because, uh, uh, and a lot of people will, will remember this. It, this literally happened. And it's what's funny to me is it's starting to go back again, which is really weird. W when we were like in the middle, like in the beginning of uh, our fitness careers. So you're looking at, you know, late nineties, early two thousands, there were exercises that there was lots of wisdom behind them that completely fell out of favor. We talk about them all the time. Barbell squats, barbell deadlifts. Literally, I know people listening right now who are younger than us don't can't even comprehend that this was a thing, but I swear to God, you went into a gym in the late 90s, early 2000s. <clears throat> yeah. Nobody barbell squatted. Nobody. Bro, this is, nobody this is so, so much not an exaggeration that I kid you not, I could go probably almost a year and not see a squat done in the gym. You could go I'll five years and not see a deadlift. Like, yeah. yeah. Oh, definitely. Definitely. I didn't even know what a deadlift was my first <laughs> yeah. part of my career. Yeah. Like that's how they used that's to scare how, people. That's they, how foreign yeah. it was in the in in a in a commercial big gym. I'm not talking about some powerlifting gym. That's the, actually, the only place you would see uh barbell squats and barbell deadlifts. Is a powerlifting gym. Powerlifting gym. Yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah. You wouldn't see well, in a bodybuilding gym or either. Or an, an athletic gym. Of like, course. But yeah, but I mean Again, what works like that was always kind of a place, and I was a little bit skewed because that. But every time I was in a commercial gym, it was like like nobody was using squat rack. Nobody even had more than one squat rack. No, I, the biggest twenty four hour fitness fifty thousand plus square foot one squat in rack in the corner, <laughs> yeah. dusty. Yeah. yeah, and people would do bicep curls, curls in it, in it. dude. Bro, I mean, it's straight bar. <laughs> That's where the meme came from. Yeah, that, that, was that a meme real thing. came from that because there was a, definitely a transition of where that's what people were doing. And, and, and the reason why this is such a good example is people now. If you, if you tell them how valuable is a deadlift, how valuable is a squat? They're like, oh my God, best exercises ever, best results ever. Just to, and that just goes to show you how the wisdom can be so lost, how people can become so ignorant. We are talking about some of the most effective exercises that strength athletes knew about. If you went back to the 60s, 70s, early 80s, everybody did deadlifts and squats, everybody. Then everybody stopped doing them. And it was so forgotten that uh, people, you're talking about the best exercises ever. Nobody did them at all. That's how forgotten it was. So to think that we're all of a sudden more uh, aware now, and that couldn't possibly happen now, you are fooling yourself. And I'm talking about the exercises that I mentioned earlier in this episode are some of those exercises. You never see anybody do heavy suitcase carries or one arm presses with barbells or bent presses or whatever. You'll never see those in the gym. Is that because they're not effective? No, they're super effective at developing incredible physiques and strength. Yeah. It's just forgotten. It just needs to be taught. It's needs totally to be a forgotten. focus. That's totally all. forgotten. You know, yeah. what's another one. Barbell, uh, uh, bent over rows. Nobody did those. Um, excuse me. Um, pullovers. Nobody did pullovers. Like yeah. there were so many exercises that people stopped doing that now everybody did you see all the made? comments on our uh or the the true king of all exercises the deadlift conversation oh, yeah, that's great that, great debate that always like, yeah brings people out of the woodwork huh? I know, yeah, yeah no our our pretty friend steve he he jumped in there on the <laughs> the <laughs> clean, cleaned over he, he is press. gorgeous he got a so. lot of, he got a lot of likes for it but i was like eh, you know the, the the problem with that is the same and what i said was the same reason why the reason why a, a clean to press is not the king of all exercises because uh, is the same reason and why a overhead squat would not be is because the limiting factor is how much you can press. Yeah. And so as much as I agree that that's a great movement and that if you could get that, that skill to do yeah. that, that you, just keeping that skill up forever yeah, is going to yeah. keep you pretty damn His strong. His thought healthy. process is, is like full incorporation of yeah. the body, right? So like totally. th there's really not a lot of examples like that, but it's that is such a high skill movement. And we're trying to talk about relatable exercises that people kind of sharpen and work on all the time yeah. in their programming. That's one that's like, I, 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 you know, and there's part of me is like, yeah, I could see, I could see where he's going with that. But, um, in terms of, uh, you know, squat versus deadlift, that's just a little bit more, uh, in, in the, um, the zeitgeist. Of well, you have to, you have to take into account. Okay. What's, what is the, the record? What's the world record for you know, a clean and press? Yeah. It's not going to come close to a deadlift. Yeah. yeah. I no, mean, like, that's a lot by the way, yeah. but that's Olympic, it is, yeah. Olympic lifters. Yeah. But let's say that like, was a 400 something, 500 yeah, pounds yeah. tops. Yeah. And it's not like, like a thousand, it's not a thousand <laughs> yeah, pounds exactly. of deadlift. And the, and the guy who could put a thousand pounds on a, on a deadlift bar is, is going to theoretically build more overall muscle than the person who can do a clean and press for that. Yeah. So, well, it goes like this for people, uh, who aren't familiar trainers will know this, but for people who aren't familiar, there's like a scale of skill that is required to perform an exercise 
Why is that important? Because if you don't have the skill, you can't acquire the benefits of the exercise. So in other words, if you can't curl because you don't have the skill of curl, I mean, and I'm using an ex extreme example so people get it. If you can't curl because you don't have the skill of the curl, well, then you can't get the benefits of the curl. So if you look at the skill list, it goes like, it kind of goes something like this, and we could break it down even further, but it kind of looks like this, like single joint exercises, multi-joint exercises, then it goes lifting with speed is at the top of skill. Now I could break that way down. We could go like supported, unsupported, unilateral, blah, 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 blah. But lifting weight with speed is the pinnacle of skill. And 99.9% .9 of the people out there and 98% of the people in gyms cannot, don't have the skill to lift properly with speed. That's right. all it is. Right. So a clean yeah. and press is like, there's, there's speed involved with that. Most people who work out it's regularly very exposing, can't do it. yeah. You that's can't why. Work. That's why it's a. That's where the. I think the argument falls on his face is just that you know it's a good. It's a good point he brings up that if you if you could do that movement and just stick doing to that movement for the rest of your life, it has tremendous overall value, uh, health, strength, everything wise. But the entry level to that is like you know. Like I you know. said, ninety something percent. It's of at the, the pinnacle of the, yeah, yeah, which, yeah the population. Which possibly and I mean, I, I already think that deadlifting and squatting is already like that's, yes, yeah, it's very demanding for the average person. That's yeah. technical as shit. Yes, I yep. mean, and, and you could spend half of your lifting career getting good at that and figuring that out, which leaves lots of opportunity for for growth and change. And well, I mean, the truth is, if you give me a thirty five year old who's not fit but otherwise healthy. I'll be able to get them to squat and deadlift at some point, and then they'll be able to reap all those benefits. You may never a, be able to get them to clean it. A, a, a good percentage of them yeah, will yeah, never be yeah. able to do a proper. I, mean, I didn't lift. teach it. Fact. Yeah. I didn't teach. I didn't teach it. No. All, the, all the years I trained, I didn't no. have anybody that. And I there's other taught. ways to get speed in a lift without yeah. being so technical, like a kettlebell. Yeah. Right. You could use something so, so much easier. There's only athletes, yeah. like young athletes, yeah. I did that with. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, I'm gonna. Uh, Take us in another direction. What's funny about what I'm about to say? It's just, it's just, uh, yeah. Adam, you remind me of this so much. Like we're oh, sitting God. here, we're sitting here, we're sitting here talking about, um, you know, like uh, how you look and you know what a woman or a guy is going to find attractive. <laughs> and it's you and I can go off uh, so hard on debates and, and arguments and stuff, and it cracks me up because uh, you and I are so similar in the sense that I think we like arguing so much because we both learn that way but for everybody around us <laughs> like shut the fuck it's up it's exhausting I know it's exhausting I mean, so, some people appreciate it some people don't it's yeah. like I mean again it's probably why our, our we're, we're polarizing I saw the last YouTube video that went up and we you know, we, we dabbled in, in religion and God talk right that's always going to divide your audience and mm -hmm. you know of course there's uh, I mean I know I put myself out there when I start talking about one of the things thing. I love I'll, I'll, be, I'll put this out there just kind of yeah less, but you help balance it so much dude it's important to have that like i don't know i even as somebody that's sort of like in the middle a lot of times <laughs> you know with what the hell's going on over here like i still appreciate that even if it's not like a strong counterpoint like it's still like something to kind of like taper it down a little bit well i'm gonna say this just to lower the tension for, <laughs> for everybody <laughs> it's very rare it's and i know this because uh, i'm this person meaning uh I, I annoy a lot of people because of it and i'm sure you do too adam uh, it's very rare to find somebody that you could really argue with who enjoys it. And yeah. then afterwards you're yeah, done. Yeah. 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 Most people yeah. don't like it. Nobody gets emotionally charged by yeah. it. Yeah. Or, or, or we get emotionally charged too, but after we're done, we're done. And well, afterwards you, I think back, I'm like, that was fun. Yeah. Maybe it's yeah. not like overkill. No, yeah. because a lot of people just, they don't like it. It's uncomfortable. So it's very rare to find someone. You and I just tend to be like that. Yeah, I, just... I I look at it almost like the same way I look at sport. Like I really love I love sport so much that uh, getting beat or losing doesn't like m make me so angry or have a bad. Like I I love to win so much that I'm okay with losing on the way to learning how to win. Right. Yeah, and so yeah. a debate is like that same way for me. And so. My feelings don't get hurt when someone is aggressively, and I mean, we operate our business that way. I mean, that's one of the thing, reasons why it survived as long as it has survived is because we embrace that, we encourage that. Yeah. That listen, I, if you have a, a point and you believe in it like strongly enough to where you want to argue and debate about it, like bring that shit on because I want to hear that. And if I disagree passionately, like I want to see that because that's where the holes are going to come yep. out, right? Yep. That's where. And and you at the end of it, 
Many times we have that. I walk away going, oh, you know what? I actually didn't think of it that way. Like now I get where he's coming from or whatever. Or you feel, you go like, yeah, I'm pretty sure he tried to poke holes in all that and it didn't go the way he thought it was going to well, go. You know? it's, so, yeah. so, you know, so it takes it's me exactly. I learned by listening. That's, kind of weird. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's why you're you the could... one really reaping the benefits. <laughs> I, yeah, I know. Like, get, you get liked, you, you get the most liked by it, right? So we have to be the, the polarizing personalities, right? <laughs> just, yeah, no, so, it's like, yeah, communication's a whole new thing for me. I've been trying to sharpen it forever, well, so I'll, eventually I'll I, get in there. I think you're just wise. I think that's yeah, what it is. Well, but anyway, so as I say... Nobody wants a three-way argument. It takes... No, <laughs> that's weird. Three ways are cool, but not an argument. Yeah. So, uh, sorry for the joke, Doug. So, this se this segue <laughs> like is perfect. Unnecessary. I know. <laughs> this, this segue is perfect uh, because uh, I was going to talk about um, listening to your friends <laughs> because... There's so much value. I know everybody, especially on social media, likes to say, everybody else is bullshit. Don't listen to anybody. All that matters is what you think. And I get the truth in that for sure. <clears throat> but I think we forget uh, the value in... Now, I'm going to preface this by saying real friends. Yeah. Okay? So like real, not shitty, idiot, whatever. Like real friends. There's so much value and listening to your friends or your spouse or somebody that you trust because they're going to be able to tell you things about yourself and about what you're doing that you're completely unaware of. And now why this is so valuable is because it requires a little trust. So like I trust you guys uh, tremendously. I trust my wife tremendously. If I, if you guys say something to me and I disagree with it and you're like, Sal, you know, you do this all the time and uh, it irritates me. And I'm like, no, I don't, no, I don't, no, I don't. And then later I can sit there and be like, so, okay, Justin, Adam, Doug, they're good guys. They're not full of shit. They are out for, you know, my best interest. I trust them. I'm going to trust what they say, even though inside I want to like argue Disagree. with it. Yeah. And then you have this great, like, ah, oh, this mm -hmm. great awareness. Now, the, the reason why I'm here with this is, and is the value that I got from training clients is, and now I'm starting to realize it for myself in a lot of different ways. Because in order for a trainer to be successful with their clients, the client has to get to that point. Because you train a client and half the time they don't believe what you're saying. Yeah. But if they can get to a point where they just trust you, then the whole world opens up. Bro, that's such, that's that's such a great yep. uh, comparison. Because and, and I was going to say before you even got to that point that, you know, the most difficult part about that is actually first finding somebody who truly cares for your well-being yes right? because uh, like uh, uh, surface friends will you know they'll want to keep you below them and so they're not going to give you that kind of advice right. like one of my favorite quotes is nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care and so you first as a coach and trainer you have to be able to to give that to your client like they have to know that you genuinely care about their well-being first and that's the first goal even before getting them to lose weight and follow this this and it's like they have to like feel that i care about them and their well-being and like that's all i'm trying to is help them figure out once i can make that con connection and then i can start to to move them in the right direction by coaching up because you're right like most people that hire you they've already failed a bunch of times on their own and they already have their own ideology around the way they, sh and they're like, and they just think, they always think that you're going to, they're going to hire you. You're going to have some like magic trick yeah. that you're going to send them. And a lot of times it's not, it's like actually helping them work through a lot of deep rooted shit. It's a, a lot of, it's like counseling yeah. and you have to help them get there. And it's like that a lot of them don't think they're signing up for that. I yeah. saw a clip that in, in people use this as a, a, a way to poke fun. It's kind of sad, but there was this clip. I don't remember what show it was from. It might've been one of those, like my 600 pound life or something like that. Mm. And there was this girl and she's obviously, I think she looked, she looked like she was five or 600 pounds. And she's talking to her doctor and she's like, and so people were using this to poke fun. But as I watched it, I felt lots of empathy uh, for what was going on. And she says, you know, I got to just learn how to eat more vegetables because I'm a picky eater. And he goes, you're 600 pounds. You're not a picky eater. I'm trying to open my horizons to vegetables because I'm a pretty picky eater. You're not a picky eater if you're 600 pounds. <laughs> and everybody laughed at it. Ha, 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 ha. And I, 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 what I heard was she's in such denial that when someone tells her, you know, something like that, she doesn't want to listen. I don't think that doctor was very effective in that case. Yeah. Now, imagine if she had a friend, and maybe she does, but imagine if she did this. She's got this friend she's known for her whole life, and she goes, you know what? 
me and Susan have known each other for a long time. Like I know she truly cares about me and she's telling me I'm being like this. And even though I feel like I'm not, and I want to deny the shit out of it, I'm just going to consider that maybe they're telling me the truth. You imagine how far people could go if they could do that. That's the value of having good, you know, people around you. Oh, I would argue. I think that self-awareness is maybe the single most important thing, skill that you'll ever learn in your life. And and evolving that skill, right? Getting better and better at that, I think, is probably one of the most important things that you could you could ever do. Uh, yeah. just, in, just to be successful, period, in life. Not just financially, business, but in re- friendships and relationships, in marriage, in raising a child. Like, the self-awareness key is, like, so, so Paramount. important. You guys yeah. ever have moments like that where your wife – this is good with spouses, too, especially, because – I think men and women will get married and then we just don't listen to it. You ever have a moment like that where your wife says the same thing over and over and you're like, no, I don't, no, I don't. And then you sit there and go, okay, maybe she's right. Yeah. <laughs> maybe yeah, I This am keeps like popping that. up. Yeah, like, oh, like, yeah, okay. Acknowledge that. I gotta, yeah, I got I to gotta work on that, you know, that one thing right there. Yeah. I mean, it makes you, a huge difference. Well, I mean, yeah, that actually happened to me recently. It was like things that, um, I don't know. I don't like to necessarily go around and fix everything all the time. Like, I know I do that sometimes to like, you know, I'll lean into that and like, you know, use that as, what, what do they call it again? Like chore, chore play. Chore play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I might lean into chore play a little bit, but for the most part, I don't like doing it. And so, but I, I, I want to get things done as well. And so I'll do it and, and, you know, and, and Courtney's a little more analytical, very like, you know, detail oriented. And so she'll see like my work and we'll just stare at it. And then like, we'll report back to me, uh, you know, sometimes like, oh, hey, like, no, this isn't good enough. This isn't a good job, you know? And, like, <laughs> and I'll be like, what are you talking about? Of course it's like, I get all like defensive, you yeah, know? Cause yeah. it's like, yeah, I like based on what I'm looking at, like I would have to, I know exactly what it'd take to do a good job. And it's sometimes that's like weeks or something. Yeah. And like, sometimes it's like, and so you don't want to admit that. Yeah. I went fast. I don't want to admit that. Yes. I know like it's not perfect. Like I, I could have done a way better job, but I got the job done, but mm-hmm. she can't get past sometimes that, you know, she can see the flaw and, and won't let it go. Yeah. And so this is like a conflict thing, but I've learned now that like, okay, like, okay, if I'm going to do this, I just have to do it right every time. And, right. and yeah. so I've, I've gotten better at that, but that used to be a lot of that conflict. or preface it to her. Like, Hey, if you want me to do this, you know, that that's, it's too. Not, it's that's not gonna, the big one. Yeah. Like, that's the next like, level. Hey, I, I can do this, but it's going to be kind of a half ass job. And yeah. if you want someone to do this professionally, like we should probably hire someone to go Dude, do that. This has like, been the constant conversation. Yeah. yeah. Dude, with <laughs> so, so it happened. So it happened with, with, with Jessica and I, so we're having a uh, baptism for the baby. And, uh, we, I get very anxious when we have big parties at our house. I don't like big parties at my house. I feel like I got to look at everything and watch everything. I got to make sure everybody's whatever. I would rather pay a lot of money, have it done at a restaurant and it's all catered and taken care of. And I just show up. Yeah. yeah. Now she's the reverse. She gets more anxious when we're doing it at a restaurant or something, because then she has to worry about. The little ones, when they take their naps, yeah. how do I do this with the baby? How do I do that? So th- there's this thing, right? So I'm like, I don't want to do this at the house. She's like, no, I'm going to plan the whole thing. So I want to do it here for the baby's naps or whatever. So I'm like, fine, we'll do it here. So inside of me, I'm still a little upset about it and anxious. But what I do is I don't let myself feel that. It's like, whatever. So last night she shows me this, uh, we, we, we're going to do it kind of outside and we're going to have all the kids come and it's going to be hot. So we're going to have like water games and stuff outside to cool everybody off. So she ordered this big like play structure thing and it was supposed to be here yesterday. She mm-hmm. shows me this email. It's not going to be now, now keep in mind that this is happening tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> she gets this email and it says, Oh, we're not going to get it till 10 o'clock uh, till maybe 10 o'clock at night, the night before she's like, Oh crap. She's like, we're going to have to put this together. And in my mind, I'm already like, you mean me <laughs> at 10 o'clock at night, the night before. Now what I now what I didn't do the collective we yeah, yeah so yeah, what, yeah. so instead I make yeah. all these other arguments we get this big fight yeah, yeah. the truth is I didn't want to do this I'm anxious about it anyway now I feel like I got to do more or whatever but I didn't communicate that instead I communicate all this other shit we get this big old fight about a bunch of other stuff yeah. yeah so this morning I had to sit down and I was like all right she's telling me because then she called me out she's like I think you're just feeling this way and I don't want to admit it you know yeah, so yeah. I sat down like yeah you're right that is what's yeah. going on and then you have way better communication about the whole thing. But anyway, where's my point with this? My point with this is, is in order to be effective at, at progressing in any direction, if you have someone you trust, 
Sometimes it's okay to have faith and listen to them. And now where is this taking me? Good trainers and good coaches understand this. Like your job as a coach or a trainer is to be able to earn the trust of your client. Otherwise, you're worthless. Otherwise, everything you say and do is worthless. The, se the second they find it too challenging, the second they think, whatever, you don't understand how hard it is for me, you love working out, you don't have kids, you don't work like I do, your back doesn't hurt, whatever, you are simply not going to be effective. And uh, I trainers are almost never coached or taught this. Only one place I've seen talk, talk about this, with, which is NCI. Yeah. I've actually seen courses Mm -hmm. And entire, you know, curriculums devoted to teaching coaches how to get their clients to kind of trust what they're doing. Right. I never learned any of that. I had to learn that the hard way as a coach. Ask the right questions and spark that communication because there's just so much there that um, they're unaware that they need to divulge to you, right? Like it's yeah. it's one of those things like you have to really look at it as more of a detective in the very beginning and like be able to have somewhat of a predictive uh, uh, conversation that leads uh, in a better direction, so you can structure everything more effectively. Totally. You know, speaking of NCI, I've been um, I've been wanting to bring this up the next time we we had a commercial for them, and we are really terrible at promoting and talking about the Wednesday call that we do with them. Oh, yeah. we are. Yeah. Every time that I do like a post where I just I get so many DMs of people going like, "What is this? Where is this? Where, yeah. yeah, and. I don't know. I don't know what the what the reason behind why we don't talk about it or promote it much. Maybe Doug, you can find out for me the exact link where to send people so they know. But and I believe it's only. I think NCI only charges ninety nine bucks. I think is what it is. They a charge month? yeah a month yeah. for that, and you're getting access to us uh, like on a private Zoom call. I mean, the calls only got maybe yeah. fifteen to thirty trainers on it every single week that have the opportunity to ask any questions about scaling and building their business. A lot of times when I know Sal gets on them, they get a lot of deep nutrition and, and supplement type questions. I mean, you name it, uh, they, they ask it. And we talk a lot about this type of stuff. Like yeah. this is the type of stuff that we communicate to these trainers is, you know, it's one thing to have the education and, and the certifications and understand, you know, human physiology and understand program design and macros and stuff like that. But then, the, the real meat of being really good trainers is this type of stuff that we're talking about right now, understanding how to communicate with clients, how to, how to make them feel and understand that you do care about them and the, the psychology of it, which I feel like is a lost art in, in coaching trainers. We put so much emphasis on uh, the science, yeah. you know, the X's and, you, and O's. Yeah. And, and I think that's why too, I get so passionate about, you know, debating and arguing some of the science nerds, because they, they, they put so much weight in that when it's like, dude, you guys, you're obviously not that great of a trainer because if you've trained enough people, you realize like that is such a small percentage of, of tools that I use with my clients. Yes, you need to have basics. You need to understand, like I'm not saying that you can be uneducated and be a really good trainer. you got to know your shit. But once you got a, a, a good base knowledge on nutrition, physiology, how to build a program for a client – Man, then the majority of it is is communication and, be, mm -hmm. and behavior modification, and and then and how to support. You, and you know what it reminds me of is like the the sort of Bible thumper approach uh, <laughs> in terms of like if I'm I'm this trainer, I got all these facts, I know what's best for you. Take it, you yeah. know, like, yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> do it. Yeah. Like it, it's just like there's no communication there. It's just like <laughs> no, you that's do actually, it. You go that's to actually, hell. That's, really good. that's actually a really good analogy because that's another thing. Like everyone's had. I mean, I grew up in a, a place like this where you know every time something went wrong or I didn't do anything right, like you know my parents would like you know cite a verse to me, like <laughs> that was working. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, same dude, right? And it's just like yeah. that. That is not like that's not the best way to convert somebody over to you is through through your life, right? Showing them like showing them right. uh the life you live and then how that's uh, th how that's played out for you i think the same thing goes with yeah, training relate like, like you just you just touting or the the science to them and beating them over the head with the science is not going to I be very effective I, you guys remember when you when you figured out if you if you told clients uh how challenging it was for you with health and fitness or whatever that they would how much more effective you became when you yeah. when it was time to coach them Oh yeah. Oh, it's such it was a amazing. Approach. That was one of the things that, you know, I, I normally say on, on the show that like, Oh, it took me five or 10 years to figure that out. That was one of the things I, I think that's actually why 
I had pretty good success even early when I was uh, was very very little education experiences. I was comfortable with being vulnerable, and I was okay with like telling my clients that like I'm just learning, or I don't know, or I'll mm -hmm. go find the answer for you. That served me so much like early on. Like that didn't that didn't bother me to. Man, you were so ahead. Yeah, I was gonna most, say such a hard concept. In that part, I was. In that part, so much that, ego in our space. So it's that's a hard one to every do. Every space. And I think that's mm -hmm. I think that was kind of a superpower early on. I think because I I definitely was not that educated. I didn't have a lot of experience. I wasn't that buff. I mean, there were so many other things that made trainers so much better than what I was, yet I was one of the most successful trainers in, in our area, right? And a lot of that had to do with that was I was okay with that. And I think I re I think that's why my clients liked me so much is that I made them feel like I'm just like you. I'm not mm -hmm. that different. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, we might have different goals. Our body types may mm -hmm. look different, but I'm, I'm trying to figure this thing out too, you know, and I've been working and, and it's not easy and I've been spending yeah. my was. I think leading with that is such a, a powerful tool. Yeah. I remember like uh, my, my studio when I used to own my studio was next to a grocery store. So every once in a while I would go to the grocery store two doors down and I'd run into a client who had just finished a workout or, you know, they you know, they lived in the area. So they're grocery shopping. And I remember that how immediately self-conscious they were about their shopping cart as soon as I ran it. And I wasn't even thinking about that. As like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, Hey John, I what's know. going on? And you'd see them like they fuck. Where do I hide? You know, I got, <laughs> and then they'd apologize. Oh, that's just because hide the bagel guests. bites. Yeah, this yeah. is for guests that are coming over. This time, like, listen, man. Like, it's like, that's actually like, one of my least favorite parts about being a trainer is uh, when yeah. you like sit at dinners with people. Like, so it, awkward. Like, I don't like. We just had a family dinner uh, on Wednesday with all of our family over. Right there was like I don't know, fifteen plus of us all at my house, and it never fails. Like. We can't sit around a plate of food and eat without somebody, Some yeah, somebody feeling guilty and needing to like tell me, <laughs> you know, what they're working on. It's just like I don't fucking care. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're my family. I love you no matter what. We, you and I both know that you've got all kinds of resources and access to me if you want it and you need it. Like right now at family time on Wednesday night is not the time to talk to me about this stuff. Like I just want to. You'll see the shirt. It's like off work. You yeah, know? yeah, it, something. And, <laughs> and it's like, and sometimes it's not even like they're like Off necessarily the like prodding, asking me questions as much as they're just like telling me what they're going to do. And it's just like, no, yeah. you're not. I was like, yeah, I've, and known it's okay. you, I've known you for a long ass time. Like, no, you're not going to do that. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, I don't, and I don't care if you do or you don't, you know uh, what I'm saying? I love, do I, it. You don't have to I love you it. either way. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So I, that is one of the things actually is I don't like is that once you've become that, the trainer, you know, in the family or in your circle of friends, like the, it's, it's so funny to see the guilt. Well, I used to, yeah. I, what I, and my family now knows, but the, what I used to always get was there's certain foods I can't eat because they'll bother my digestion, but people would always think it's because it was some like special diet or something I was on. Yeah. Oh, 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 you don't eat dairy. Is it because it's inflammatory and it makes you fat? It's like, no, it gives me diarrhea. That's what I mean. Yeah. Oh yeah. Bread makes people fat. No, no, no. Yeah. Bread fucks up my stomach. Yeah. That's why I don't I eat just bread. feel like yeah. shit. Yeah. yeah. If you had so I don't want to eat it. If you had yeah. gluten-free bread, I'd fuck, I'd fuck it up right now. I yeah. to do that. <laughs> well, you know what else is, is getting fucked up right now? So you guys remember this whole thing going on with like the orcas and like how they're like knocking ships over and all yeah, that that's stuff. Like a thing. It's like a really bizarre phenomenon that's happening. They're still like, going. A lot of them. Well, okay. So now there's examples of gray whales doing the same thing. Like almost they were taught or like had, it, it, this is like spawned now to like, like a different species of whale doing the same exact thing. Attacking boats. Attacking boats. And then also there's like, there's been all these examples of uh, this, this one like sea otter uh, just going around and like biting surfers and then like, and they can't catch it. And they're all trying to like find this, like, it's like biting them and like terrorizing like all these surfers. And I'm like, what? dude, the animals are, are rising up. And they're they're coming after. Wow! Us. And yeah. Now, is it? Do you think this is legit, or do you think it's just like po like it's because of like media? pockets of uh, yeah? And we're like instances. reporting it, making it feel like yeah. Maybe. Or is it Aquaman who's ordering? All the <laughs> <laughs> There's something going on. We pissed off some some animals there in in the ocean. I saw I a be video honest. of a, of a um, somebody was. Uh, well, I showed you guys the one where the person was kayaking and a whale accidentally yeah. swallowed him. Yeah, I saw which is terrifying. I yeah. saw another one where this person was. It looked like a kayak. I think it was a kayak. And a, and a whale, you know, whales will come out of the water and then, mm -hmm. but you don't think about how big of a wave that produces when it's next to you. Yeah. Uh, terrifying, bro. The <laughs> video and this big at like massive mountain of an animal and then the wave that comes. 
I would be the scariest damn thing. Dude. You could yeah. possibly experience. You can't do anything. You yeah, just... no, that's really scary. And I imagine if he actually landed on you. I mean, that would knock you out and you'd probably drown. Oh, I mean, 100%. That's, yeah, that's Easily. beyond scary. So, are, yeah. <laughs> so what you're saying, Justin, is the I the fact that I don't go in the water yeah. beyond my knees is justified now. Yeah, you, you're, okay. you're probably yeah, you're probably a smart smart move I'm on safe. your part. I'm safe. Yeah. Hey, did you see um, Patrick Bet David interviewed? Um, I sent it over to you. Sal. Did you actually watch it? I did. Oh, you did. I did. Oh my goodness. Oh, it makes me so happy. It's like, Remember I, I said, listen I'm, to your friends? I'm one for you. Yeah, <laughs> I hit you just the right you're time. You're one for two. You just had that conviction. I did it. Yeah, you're like, oh, <laughs> fuck, I got to watch this. I don't send it over to me. I should listen He to always does this and I never watch. I mean, so I, I actually did, I, I knew very little about the, I actually did more homework looking him up after the fact. I didn't know who he was. Um, I watch a lot of uh, PBD's content. I like, I think he's a, a phenomenal interviewer and he- He did great. Dude, he, he- I, what, he what? did not get shook. He asked them a really no, a question nobody wants to ask. I like, mean, so the, you know the Clinton kill list, all the people connected to the Clintons. That yeah, game? that's what he it's asked. It's Substantial and and Weiner Anthony Weiner, I think his name yeah. just squirmed and got aggressive and, and defensive. defensive. Yeah. Wait, this is the one that his name Anthony Weiner. He also like was caught. With a dick pic, right? Yeah, right. yeah. Send and 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 trust me, PBD found a nice way to slide that in and like uh, freaking throw a jab at him that way too. So, yeah, but so he also his laptop there. also um, had all this potential information that was damning to the the Clintons. Wow, and stuff like that. Yeah, remember that whole like smash the the hard drives, Hillary Clinton's. Like, oh yeah, yeah. yeah it was he was a big part of that. Thousands of emails, and there deleted. was speculation that he had he had information on them. So that's kind of. I don't. Direction. So I was bringing it up because uh, you know, just more of a shout out to. Maybe this can be our shout out today because I don't think I've actually shouted PBD out before. But you know, of all, including Joe Rogan, because Joe Rogan's a phenomenal interviewer. Um, Tucker Carlson, Tucker Carlson is a phenomenal yes. interviewer. I would say. I would say Patrick Bet David brings on and takes on more people he disagrees with than anybody else yep. I know. Mm. Yep. Like he, and he, he keeps his cool and he, he stays on it, task. And yes. He, I mean, he, he does a really good job yeah. of bringing on very challenging conversations. He does not shy away from somebody who strongly disagrees with his point of view more than any, more than anybody I know. Like Joe, Joe's really good about like bringing like a good range of all these guests, but he tends to bring for the most part, like m people moderate with yeah. with their yeah. beliefs, and he doesn't get into a lot of like hard arguments or debates. Where PBD will bring he brings some people. on people he's more interested in. As yes, opposed exactly. To Joe, like on both sides, right? Yeah. Like Joe will bring people on that he's you know curious about. You know what's interesting is that because the media space is shifting, I'm seeing more and more podcasts have these big guests on podcast hosts. Uh, Russell Brand, oh, had, he's another uh, great uh, DeSantis on. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and and they're and so I feel like these politicians are going in this direction now. Vivek Ramaswamy has been doing this now for a while, and and he goes on podcasts where they go after him, and he does a good job of defending. But I feel like the the direction is starting to move in that way because of the power. Yeah. Of it's like social proof. Media. Yeah. Yeah, dude. So that's a good thing. But he does it. P PBD does an incredible. Yeah, job. he he's a great one to challenge people like he said like he heard, is you know yeah. he's, he's a really he's really some socialists on there before he's interviewed and like people that uh, disagree with him economically it's pretty oh yeah i mean he's like one of, like i said he's one of my favorite to go listen especially if it's somebody who i don't agree with i want to hear i want to hear that interview because i know he's going to challenge him and so that was a that was a i didn't even know who that guy was until then but boy when he brought the 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 Clinton hit list and it was like four, <laughs> yeah. 46, 46 names connected. I mean to that's them. pretty scary if suicide. you're if you've worked with them and like you just see like so his this big list of people his just, big hmm. argument and debate back right the Anthony Weiner yeah. was like they're they're seventy eighty years old I could connect a bunch of people I could connect a bunch of dead people to a seventy and eighty year old so that's not hard which is a fair argument right yeah. but these are like not just old people dying. They're they're weird yeah yeah they're, like a lot of, yeah they're like a lot of like there's a lot of and i'm sure that list of the 46 um there's some sl like real tragic random real deaths that are slid in there to like yeah. make the list look bigger but there's quite a few on there that make you go like wow it's a younger healthier that person doesn't make you at all curious and skeptical like that that's just where i just i, I want to like I, I don't know i i can't like 
relate, I guess. <laughs> you know, I can't relate at all. I can't just take something at face value of like, oh, what's well, yeah, well, you know, that's just how it goes. Like people uh, die. Do you, do you think there's any do you think there's any percentage does left or right? Right? Do you think there's a, 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 any amount of politicians that I remember when I got into this with Brendan because he was arguing this with me. I don't believe there's anybody that's in in politics that is genuinely good. I really Not at high levels, maybe yeah. local. Right. But you ain't going to make it that high unless you're, first of all, there's a self selection yeah, bias. Exactly. In order to want to do that, maniac, narcissist. Like, yeah. There's no way you can make it through otherwise. Yeah. yeah. And I then, like and then there's so much, there's so much structure uh, around these establishments that they're not going to let you, like, remember Tulsi Gabbard started rising in the Democrat oh, yeah. party? They took her down. Ron Paul started doing this in the Republican party. They took him down. Yeah. Like their the, own, the own party examples of yeah. good. Yeah. RFK Politicians. right now he's starting to rise in the Democrats uh, party there. They tried to shut him up. They tried to censor him in Congress. Yeah. So I think to get to that level, it's like, you got to play the game, man. I don't know how else you could, you could make it. I really don't. Yeah. That's unfortunate. One of the most effective ways to lose weight, get lean and keep it off forever is to work with a coach. Well, there's a company called NutriSense that has some of the best coaches around who work with CGM, Continual Glucose Monitors. In other words, they can monitor your glucose in real time, discover what foods work with your body and when which ones work against your body. This is technology meets coaching. It's incredible, so much so that we invested in the company. Check this company out. Go to NutriSense.io forward slash mind pump. Use the code mind pump and get $30 off. NutriSense is spelled N-U-T-R-I-S-E-N-S-E. -E. Again, dot I-O forward slash mind pump. All right, back to the show. Our first caller is Benjamin from Illinois. Benjamin, what's happening? How can we help you? Not much. Uh, thanks for taking the call. Uh, I submitted the question, not sure if you guys have it in front of you, but um, loved your program. I used an anabolic, or sorry, um, aesthetic. Now I'm on anabolic and or sorry, not anabolic, but um, working up through some of the power lifts, bench press, squat, deadlift. Um, you know, it's, I feel like I have things pretty dialed in. I've uh, gained about 70 pounds of muscle or sorry, 70 pounds of weight in my deadlift, you know, 60 pounds on my squat and my bench just doesn't seem to go anywhere. I just kind of looking for a little input about, is it form based or I need to focus on some ancillary exercises um, to get things moving. It's always been a struggle point for me. And I feel like my diet's and everything else sleeps fine. Um, and just in recommendations. Yeah. I, am I seeing that right? You're uh, two, two forty five, two reps. That's my most, uh, I did two fifty two reps. It's my max bench that I've done, but I mean, I've gone from like doing two thirty to two forty five, uh, all while adding, you know, 70 pounds to a deadlift during that same time frame. So it's, and you're, and you're, like been a pretty good and you're 187 pounds, pretty strong, bro. There's a lot of there's a lot of room. Yeah. yeah. With the deadlift and squat, there's a lot more room yeah. than there is with the bench press. Um and sure. yeah, so what we tend to do is we, you know, I don't know, when I was a bench kid is at least a difficult one. Yeah, bench is a little bit different, especially for, you know, a guy your size and body weight. I mean, your deadlift and squat is exceptional. It says there you you're you're deadlifting 455 for 4. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, and you're a 315 pound. These are um, good. These are good numbers. Yeah. They're, they're, they're pretty damn good. Um, now, uh, let me ask you this. Are, what's your overhead press look like? Cause that exercise sometimes mm -hmm. makes a big difference for some yeah, people. Translates well. Do in your program, I was getting up to 164 reps. Okay. You're doing pretty damn good. Have you now, have you done anything with progressive resistance like bands or chains? Not with, not on the bar. Um, I have some bands I could add to it. I add that in for some of my, you know, um, off day exercises, but not with the bar. No. Okay. And then how often are you bench pressing? Yeah. Anabolic advancement. Right. It's frequency. I, on average, twice a week. I'm probably doing, yeah, about twice a week. Okay. So here, here's something you could do at your level. And I say your level cause you're pretty damn strong is you can reduce the focus on the other lifts. So you just, you do them, you practice them, but you're not trying to push them. But yeah. then the effort you put into your bench press and the exercises that help with the bench press, like overhead press, I would say, maybe incline press, is where I'd put the effort. You're benching twice a week. Once is heavy, low. The other one is more of a, what they would call a dynamic, where you're lifting more for speed mm -hmm. and, and explosive power, but the intensity is lower in terms of you know okay. how hard you're going. 
And then um, I would say every maybe two or three weeks, you could add bands to your heavy day yeah. where you have weight on the bar plus bands giving you kind of this progressive resistance. And then you should start to see the weight move up a little bit. You can even look at, and this is where I kind of like using the product, the slingshot, you know, in terms of Oh, that's of one like, way to do it, yeah. Yeah, just the, it, it, it does the same effect, but uh, in terms of you being able to load a bit more and so you get uh, acclimated to heavier weight um, and it gives you that uh, elastic energy to really help, uh, you know, give you a little bit of a boost. Also too, I mean, leg drive and the actual technique of bench pressing, uh, if you can get your body more rigid and anchored, um, it's going to contribute a lot more to your force output. So th that would be my two things I would really peer into. And then the overhead okay. press and, and, and deep dips, uh, if, you know, if, if, if it's really just like digging out of the hole was the issue, um, that yeah. would be my go-to. I mean, I see some benefit too of running anabolic advanced too. So, I mean, I think that he gets some value. He's a, definitely an experienced lifter. So maybe consider doing that as far as the next program is running that. Have you, um, have you done just a, sure. have you done like a full cycle of not bench pressing and focusing just on the incline or using dumbbells? I add in dumbbells. I've never given it up completely. And then just did other stuff. I mean, I go back and forth over the years. Um, I mean, this is, you know, 10 year issue with the bench press more or less being stuck. Um, but I've gone off a periods of time and come back and it seems like it's always the same plateau. Yeah. So, I mean, especially with that experience, that much experience, sometimes it helps to change the exercise, something that's similar, but different, like an incline or just dumbbells, and then just get as strong as you can in that lift. Then you go back to your traditional bench press and then you'll find within two or three weeks that you passed your previous, uh, you know, PR. The other thing too, is you're, you're, you're 187 pounds. It says you're 35. you are you, are you pretty lean? I've never been tested. I'd probably in the ten percent range. I would imagine. I mean, twelve percent maybe. I don't yeah. Know. When's the last time yeah, you like went be on a surplus? Yeah. Right? When's the last time you tried to gain like some size? Well, I was recently um, during that bulking phase. I mentioned those numbers with the deadlift, okay. and even at four fifty five, I got up to four seventy five on that. I was, I was about three thirty three hundred calories. I was in bulking phase for at least four months. Um, I'm taking a little break, just doing like a micro cut right now, but. Um, yeah, I've been. I mean, maybe I should up the calories. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you, I mean, you just went on a bulk. So that answered my question. But you know, at your at your level, that much training experience. You said you've been working out for ten years, and you kind of get stuck in this position, in this uh, position or this lift. This is where the more advanced stuff starts to yeah. make more sense. And I don't mean advanced as in harder. So sometimes I, yeah. I say that to somebody no. like, oh, I got to go just more nuance. Yeah. Like you think, oh, I got to go to failure. I got to go do heavy negatives. I got to do forced reps. No, no, that's not what I mean. I mean, in, in the sense like pause reps yeah. can be really good. Chains okay. and bands can be really good. Heavy supported isometrics could be really good. Yeah, like yeah. even half, half reps with like a yoga block, you know, so that way too, like it depends on where your sticking points, I guess is yeah. where I would kind of peer into. I also really like what yeah. you, your original advice you both gave. I, and I didn't get really an answer from Ben. If, if you've done this, like, have you ever like ran a whole program cycle where like your main focus during that program is like, I'm going to get like hella strong at dips and low to where you're like, mm -hmm. you got 90, hundred and something pounds between your legs while you're doing a dip. Have you ever tried to get really strong with weighted dips? Uh, no, although I did just buy a dip bar in my basement. Bro, so there you go. Uh, I, need yeah. to, I need to install it. But So there, there's so much value in me. that and you'd be surprised to carry over into a bench press. Like, you know, make it a goal yeah. right now to see how, how much weight you can get up to with, uh, with uh, heavy loaded dips. Yeah, I want to say like okay. one of the limiting factors a lot of times I've experienced and I know a lot of my clients experience was like an instability in the shoulder because like at a certain point you keep loading, loading and trying your best uh, when if you notice that um, where does it where, where's the weak point where where, where do you tend to start feeling a lot of the, the tension and, and it may be like getting to a point where it's painful or I mean I could only get to a certain level before my shoulders would talk to me um, and so yeah. I started really working on shoulder mobility and rotational uh, mobility to get my ro rotators to respond and to keep my shoulder more stable which then helped me to generate more force yeah, it does feel like shoulders are the sticking point. I started doing some band work with the rotator cuff, uh, some isometrics. Maybe it made a little bit of a difference so far. I should probably stick with it. Um, but it does feel like I, there's a general sense of, I, mean, I don't have any like actual posterior instability of the shoulder or anything like that, but it does feel like 
that is the weak point when I'm trying to push off. Yeah. It's it's usually the case at this at this point. At this point, that's when it starts to make a big difference. You know, so to put it differently, generally speaking, when someone kind of gets started and it's the first few years of their lifting, I mean, you're looking at just general strength, general muscle building, yeah. <laughs> all that stuff. As you get do this for longer and longer, I mean, you've been doing this for 10 years and you want to add more weight to the bar, now you're getting into the sport of bench press, right? Or the sport of yeah. deadlift. Mm -hmm. Now it becomes much more about maximizing leverage and technique and stability. It becomes, uh, you know, minimizing any power leakage. It becomes much more uh, intricate, I would say, at this point than it did like the first few years that you lift it. Like if you called me and said, I've been working out for two years, I'm like, oh, it's going to, you know, here's a few things you can do. But someone like you, this is where I would have fun with, like I said, isometrics, uh, bands, um, you know, speed presses, changing the movement up a little bit, like to a slightly different exercise or getting stronger in something that may be revealing a weakness, like an overhead press. Like, you know, uh, you know, that did it for me at one point when I got really good at overhead carries and overhead presses, I saw my bench press go up. So mm -hmm. this is where it gets a little bit more into the sport and not, you know, maybe what has worked for you in the past. I would also recommend that uh, of all that great advice right there, you take one or two tops yeah, of those and yeah. really implement it and measure it and track it. Like I was giving you the weighted dips yeah. thing. Like that's why I like, I would just focus on one thing like that. Or if you go to the band speed stuff, like pick one or two of the things that we're, we're giving you as potential, yeah. you right, know, advanced tips. Yeah. And, and really try and perfect it, get good at it, get stronger at it for, you know, four to five weeks and then maybe implement another another technique and play around with it, and then see what you notice uh, has the the greatest carryover into your bench days, and 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 start to implement like that. But don't throw all of it at once because then it's going to be tough yeah. to measure what's really working for you. Got it. Okay. No, I'll definitely try. It. And the slingshot device that you mentioned that that's like a aftermarket device you can buy online. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 Mark Bell. Yeah, Mark Bell's products. Yeah, he 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 has those available. Got it. Yeah, yeah. No, Mark Bell. Yeah, yeah, that's a great, easy way to apply what I said with the progressive resistance. Yeah, it's it's super okay. convenient instead of trying to set up the bar with with bands. It's way more convenient. Yeah, that'd be nice. Um, and I don't know if you guys have any more time. I did have one other second question written down there, just about a kind of a chronic glute media spasm. It usually hits me with deadlift. Sometimes a squat obviously doesn't hold me back too much, but I'll feel it afterwards. It just keeps probably my left sided. I, it's either the glute medius or minimus. It just kind of gives a little pop and then it spasms and really holds me back for a day or two. You know, I've done prime. I've strengthened it up with some dynamic, you know, 90, nineties some active pigeons type stuff, but it just seems like it's been going on for about a year now. And, you know, I don't really know what to target it to, to get it like X. I mean, to specifically to go away. I and mean, we do hip thrusts, add that in there too. Yeah. You're, you're okay. Because so you, you got a little bit better by doing, some of the things that you mentioned, like active pigeon in 9090, I think what you need to do is yeah. lateral strengthening yeah. exercises. Mm -hmm. So, okay. yeah. So I would do like lateral sled drags would be great. That'd be a great way okay. to, to get that to happen. Got it. And you think like, um, on what's the squat? The Cossack? Cossack, yeah, Cossack squat. Yeah. Cossack squat lunges. would be good. I, a good, a good, a good primer for that is the assisted Miguel. Right, it's the it, yeah. you. I think uh, Squat University's got a good one. I believe we did it on the on the YouTube channel. Do you know if we did? We it, actually did Maps Prime Pro. Do we have the assisted. We, we have, I don't know if we do or not. McGill. Is it assisted or is it just a, a, so the regular ones assisted. in Prime Pro? You just grab. Yeah, you would grab a a, a squat rack. Yeah, but I mean, I'll, I'll do that some because I have some similar uh, issues sometimes and uh, yeah. doing that five to 10 times on each side for two sets. Yeah. It's, really, it's really exercise. primes that well. Yeah, but at your, at your strength though, Ben, uh, you know, connecting is important. That's what it'll, it'll do for you, but you probably just need to get stronger laterally even more so. so I mean, literally a lateral okay. sled drag would be the best. Literally, yeah. where you attach okay. it and you pull it and you walk sideways, crossing your legs Strength over. Strength and a lot of volume and yep. uh, low uh, uh, damage. That's like one of your best go-tos. Yeah, totally. Sure. Okay. I'll see if my wife lets me buy a sled for the backyard. <laughs> you got to go ask her permission. <laughs> 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 Thanks, man. We get it. Yeah, thank you, guys. All you right, got man. it, man. That was a little, little, low gangle, little yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> my bad. Yeah. yeah. No, you know, uh, at the, it, it gets to a point with strength where it becomes a sport, you know, you're like, you're not going to necessarily get 
tons of uh, benefit by adding 10 pounds to your bench press yeah. uh, at that point. Uh, but it gets a little bit more technical. I, I, For me, for my deadlift, getting it better was just deadlifting more. Then at some point, I had to get really creative. Yeah, you know? yeah, you really have to peer into it more and make it a, a highlight it as a, as a focus. And I think, too, to we kind of went to the dips route. Like I, The reason why I liked it so much, it, it almost – reminds me of you know how i was able to get more strength from a deadlift from like a deficit deadlift right mm -hmm. so it's like you get a little further in the range of motion you get comfortable there you can produce and generate force uh in a in a position where it's like it's you're not in an advantageous spot for leverage right so to be able to grind and generate and focus on that will will definitely produce uh you know a lot more strength well i also think it's because it also addresses a little bit of the shoulder stability component too of course definitely. so you you both hit on that as like a potential you know limiting factor he highlighted that could be too yeah. so you add in the deficit point that you're making with a little bit of that strength stability in the dips like that that's why I, that was the why i went that direction to kind of get you'd kill two birds with one stone especially if that's not something he's ever really tried to get strong at like i think just trying to yeah. get really strong at heavy loaded dips and even unilateral some, work too yeah. you know see that, some carry that'll, that'll help our next caller is jim from illinois jim what's happening how can we help you Hey guys, how's it going? Good. Great. Very excited. Um, been listening to you guys since episode seven. Wow. Started listening to you for your fitness and uh, exercise advice, but I stayed listening because of your fatherhood and family adventures. And it brings a smile to my eyes because, uh, to my face, because, uh, Everything you guys are going through, I went through like 15 years ago. <laughs> My one advice to you is enjoy it because it goes fast. Yeah, yeah, oh, it does. yeah. I tell everyone that the best things God ever gave us was kids and dogs. So yeah, That's why I keep having them. 100%. Right? <laughs> Calm down, Sal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Jim. What you got for us? All right. I'll just read my question because I'm long-winded and I don't want to go on a tangent. So. What is the difference between a giant set and a super set? And are they not similar to doing a circuit set with weights? I know some of your workouts like your cardio program use them. That's, if all you have to work with in a gym is the Smith machine, can you do squats, deadlifts, good mornings, and bench with this machine? I know it's not as good, but does it help at all? Or am I wasting my time with this exercise machine? Also, training for a Tough mutter. Just finished anabolic. Now I'm doing MAPS cardio, then going into MAPS OCR. I'm actually started OCR already. Event is August 26th, um, 58. I weigh 198 pounds. I lost 50 pounds and went from 233 to 180 through eating clean and doing MAPS anabolic, which I love that program. Boom. I then followed Adam's advice and I went on a bulk. Um, now I'm at a 198 pounds. My maintenance calories are 3,200. And as I put on muscle, I've dropped three pant sizes. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I was going to start a mini cup, but since I'm doing uh, OCR, I decided to scrap that. <laughs> My last question, which I probably know the answer to is, am I doing too much as I jog every day? I'm um, starting MAPS OCR program, and I averaged between 12,500 to 25,000 steps a day at my work. So, All right. Now, the first question, let's start with the first one, which was- like Five questions, yeah. Yeah, giant sets, and it's just, okay, so the, the term giant set was used by bodybuilders to refer to a superset that it consisted of three, typically three- to maybe four exercises. Bodybuilders rarely ever combine more than two exercises. Super and if they do, two. yeah, if they do, then they'll go three. So a superset is two exercises back to back. A giant set is typically three back to back. What's the difference between that and a circuit? Circuits are typically more than three and don't involve mm -hmm. any rest. Yeah. yeah. Or it's, minimal. It's the whole workout. Yeah. yeah it's like circuit, through. circuit, yeah. circuit. You rest to get water. Circuit. Whereas bodybuilders might do two, like three exercises and then they'll rest for like three to five minutes and then perform it again. So that's kind of the difference. All right. Smith machine, bench press, you could do with the Smith machine. Squats, deadlifts, good mornings, not so great. 
especially deadlifts. I would never do a deadlift. Inverted on, rows. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's about all I got. Yeah. Overhead press you could do on it. Uh, you could do rows on it. Um, but squats don't are not the same at all. Well, it, deadlifts we, you can't even. Okay. So, and it's what I would do in replace of that is just uh, dumbbell work, dumbbell mm -hmm, work, yeah. and then go unilat unilateral. Yep. Yeah. Right. So, like, so it's not like it's because we're going to get a bunch of grief with the Smith machine advocates on here. Right. So it doesn't mean you can't do those movements. It's just, they are not ideal because of the way your spine is shaped and the way that track works. Okay. So it's not ideal for movements like good mornings and deadlifts. So if I, if I had a client who was telling me, Oh, I've all of you guys, this Smith machine at this gym, but I want to do squats and deadlifts. I'd say, do they have dumbbells? Yeah, you're right. If you got a Smith machine, you got dumbbells. Yep. And then I would say, instead of doing your, you know, deadlifts on a machine like that do single legged dumbbell deadlifts and you're going to get mm -hmm. very strong by doing that and it's way more challenging way more beneficial squats i'd say let's do bulgarian split squats with dumbbells instead of doing that smith machine so that's basically what i would have them do if there's a smith machine there i know there's dumbbells there and that's what let's sort of have them do yeah and then for your uh obstacle course racing question he's doing the right thing right now mm -hmm. which is ocr you are there's two there's two things that people need to consider with it Everybody considers the first thing, which is, do I have the fitness? Do I have the stamina? Nobody considers the second thing, which is, there's a lot of skill involved. Grip strength. Yeah, there's a lot of skill yeah. involved with the some of the movements, okay? With a lot of the movements, a lot of the obstacles. Let me put it this way. If you have two people doing the same obstacle, one of them is very skilled at the obstacle, and the other person is not at all, the person without the skill is going to exert like three times as much energy, try to perform the same thing. So one thing that a lot of people mess up with or don't even focus on with OCR is practicing the obstacles, like just practicing the obstacles and getting good at the skill of scaling a wall, jumping off, crawling under things, throwing a spear, climbing yeah. you know, ropes like that makes a huge difference. In fact, they have studies on athletes, like really high level athletes. And they show that uh, like a cyclist at a very high level burns less calories cycling mm -hmm. than somebody who's uh, at a lower level because they've gotten so good at the technique of it. Their bodies just become like this machine with it. So I'm going to ask you, Jim, what do you think your limiting factor is? Is it your fitness? Do you do you feel like you're not fit enough to, to complete the task? Uh, are you familiar with the, uh, you know, with the obstacles? Like what are we, what are we working with? Well, I ran in it last year and, uh, my grip strength needs work because hmm. they have a, I call it the American. If you ever watch that Ninja show, they have a yeah. TV, yeah. they have an event like that where you got to do a ladder. Then you swing to these circle mm -hmm. things yeah. and then you got to do a trapeze. Otherwise you fall in the water. Right. And my, my grip gave out before it, oh, my arm strength. Yeah, yep. So. Yeah. Some dead hangs. I mean, yeah. we have. Good there's a lot of that in the program. Yeah. There's so Which much. Great. There's yeah. so much good. I've been doing the rice bucket. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Rice bucket. Those dead hangs. Yeah. You're you're gonna do a lot of uh, uh, you know good strengthening with that, and also to just like different types of yeah. Uh, you know, if, if it's ropes, if you could attach that for like inverted rows or anything, and just have those types of grips that you're going to experience uh you know with the challenges would help i'm i'm really proud of that program we don't talk about it a lot it's kind of like uh, the redheaded stepchild for us like nobody yeah. uh, mentions it that often we need to revisit it for but sure. we i mean when we wrote that uh, uh with amelia boone like we really like part of that process like where where do most people struggle and and what you what you struggle with was one of the common ones so what we programmed in there is to address that so yeah. that's yeah. That program's pretty robust to get the average person to be able to complete one of those and do pretty well at it. So here's I, the other I thing too. That. Here's the thing too, Jim. And I, and I I know at the end of August is the competition, so I wouldn't do it for this one. But if you end up doing another one, there's something else to consider. Um, what? Let me ask you this: How much do you weigh, and how tall are you? Uh, one ninety eight and five ten. Okay, so. Not for this one because it's too soon. It's coming yeah. up here. It's around the corner. So don't do what I'm about to say Drop for this one. 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. So when you talk when you're talking about grip strength, you know, if you if you lost 15 pounds, mm -hmm. okay, you would have way better grip strength on those events than if you if you got stronger in your grip and stayed the same body weight. Like a lot of people don't realize that. Like your strength to weight. You can have a lot of strength in your grip, but if it's in comparison to your weight. That's where things tend to get thrown off. In fact, you could get weaker in your grip and lose 15 pounds and you might perform better 
uh, as well. So not for this one. I don't want you to lose weight. It's too soon. So don't try to cut right now. That'll screw you up. But for if you do another event and you and you find that the grip part is really screwing you up. Try like, and come in leaner. Yeah, you come in lighter. It makes a huge difference. And now, can you build... Can you build strength or muscle and endurance at the same time? Because I kind of look at it like a scale. If you build endurance, you lose muscle. Or if you build muscle, you might lose endurance. So can you can you build both at the same time? I want the holy grail, guys. Yeah. <laughs> it, depends, it depends who I'm talking to. Generally speaking, strength improves endurance. I say general because as you get, as you start to get more advanced, that's not necessarily not necessarily the case. But if you're asking about performance, that's different. Okay, performance is different. Now you could take somebody and you could have them simply become better at a skill. You could have them lose some strength, but because the the event requires them to maneuver their body, their strength to weight ratio actually gets better. Like in other words, if you lost thirty pounds but you got 10 pounds weaker in all your lifts, you're still stronger as a ratio of your body weight. And if it was a body weight type of competition, you feel stronger, right? So performance is, is, is very different. Um, and that's, that's a much more specific question. And then the answer becomes a little bit more accurate, but generally speaking, can you improve both? You can, it just, they just happen slower rather than focusing on one or the other. Yeah. Smaller, uh, margin and longer, a period of time, I would say. And it's, it, I guess it's kind of similar to trying to lean out and build at the same time, like the unicorn sort of uh, yeah. uh, program, but you know, and it's, it's not impossible, but it is definitely difficult. It's difficult to, to take those both on at once versus kind of, you know, really focusing on one and then transitioning to the other. Totally. Well, when this event's over and I get through OCR, what, what, program would you guys recommend for me next uh, uh have you done symmetry yeah oh symmetry is great you have symmetry no i do not oh that's the best one yeah. Yeah. symmetry with like we'll a cut would everything be, yeah symmetry with a cut would be awesome so lean out do symmetry and then uh okay. and then prepare for the next ocr event you want to do i got one last question for you too mm -hmm. uh, sometimes i find it kind of hard to hit my protein intake i was in the store and I seen they now have protein water. Is that stuff <laughs> any good? Because it's like twenty grams of protein in a bottle of water. Yeah, it's collagen. Uh, it's collagen in there. There's, there's, I think there's collagen protein. Yeah, that'll that'll help you hit your targets. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, it'd be yeah, better if you like, got it from food. But if it's hard, that that'll help. Drink that with each meal. Yeah, that'll mm -hmm. help. Do you remember? Well, how I'm hitting like a hundred and fifty or so. Of protein, but I know I should be a little bit higher than that. So. Yeah, you'd be better. I mean, you could do that. You'd be better off getting a high quality protein powder and just adding it at the end of the day, okay. I would say. Well, I thank you guys. You got it, man. All right, yeah, Jay, yeah, good luck. Good luck. Event, yeah, man. good luck, man. It was a pleasure talking with all of you. You thank too, Jim. I like him. Yeah, he's an OG, man, yeah, since uh, episode seven. You know, I remember. Is that what he said? Seven? Seven. Yeah, seven. Episode oh, seven. Oh, I missed that. That's why he actually had seven questions. I don't know if you guys counted. <laughs> for, 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 keep tallying For the them number up. of the episode, <laughs> he started. I was like, yeah, yeah. let him go. You know, <laughs> yeah. I remember specifically when this happened. I was younger. I was trying to do one of my first, like, actual cuts. And I was dropping uh, weight on the scale, lowering my calories. And I'm like, oh, my God, I could do more pull-ups. Yeah, I'm I'm getting stronger, and I'm yeah, like, oh wait weird. a minute, I'm lighter. Like yeah. that's that's when the like that that whole paradigm shifts. I'm like, oh, it's because I'm lighter. Yeah. I'm able to do more. People don't consider that when they do. It's something actually like wild. What a, a huge difference huge. it makes. Yeah, there's times where I don't even do any pull ups, whatever, and I just leaned out 15, 20 pounds, and then I hop up, and all of a sudden I can do way more pull ups <laughs> yeah. than when I was training them. Like you know, two six months later, right? Totally. Our next caller is Os Osvaldo from Florida. Osvaldo, what's happening? How can we help you? Hey, what's going on, guys? What's up, man? What's up? Um, so basically, um, uh, I'm six, two, I'm 272 pounds and I'm 35.7% body fat. I'm trying to obviously get that down. Right. And then, so I had somebody kind of give me a little calories and, uh, macros at 2,462 calories, 258 grams of carbs, 209 grams of protein and 66 grams of fat. But I find that very hard to stick with, and I always end up eating more food. 
sometimes I'll wake up in like the middle of the night, like at two in the morning and I'll go to the kitchen. I like weigh it out and everything and I like eat it and I go back to bed. So I guess that my question is based on my size and I'm 42 years old. Um, is that the right track or I just, I don't know. What do you, what do you guys think? Where, where'd you get this Cal? Who gave you this number? Where'd you come up with this specific number of 2462? Uh, it he was, uh, somebody I met that is like a, he's like a trainer. I met him outside of the training world Okay. and he basically, I sent him pictures and he, he kind of, that's what he came up with. Yeah. It's, he, he guessed. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> so that's, uh, he, he guessed off used too. his eight balls. Just, yeah. Yeah. yeah, dude, there's a, such a huge, such a wide variance when it comes to caloric maintenance and what would be a cut. And now there's a lot of things here to dissect. Uh, it's probably too little for you. It's just why you're waking up in the middle of the night. So it's hungry. definitely low fat for him. Yeah. The fat is low. 66 grams is kind of low. The other part, the other thing that you didn't say, um, here, but I'm reading your question. If you don't mind me saying on sure. the podcast was that you you're clean and sober for seven years and food kind of became your drug as well. So that kind of clouds this up a little bit. Okay. Because the cravings could be because you're eating too little, which I think you might be, or it could be that you need that, that fix that food can provide us when we don't have something that we're, you know, the things that we're used to using. I'll, I'll say this. If you want to find out what calories you should be eating, you want to track what you're eating when you're eating normally uh, and be very meticulous. And then you can cut from there because then you've figured out kind of what your maintenance is. And I would assume at your size, your maintenance is probably, I would say 2,400 calories is probably too low for you, but I don't know because I don't know what your maintenance is at. And that's, that's what I would do if I was your trainer. Now, the second thing I'll say is this. If you find that tracking and counting actually makes it harder for you just because it's like you're putting too much focus on everything, I would take a step back and be a little bit different with my guidelines. I would say something like, um, I'm not going to eat heavily processed foods. I'm going to eat as much as I want, but nothing nothing that's processed. And I'm going to hit, uh, you know, let's see, you're 270 pounds. What's your target body weight? How much body, what, what do you, you want to weigh? See, I don't know. That's the thing. Like, I don't know if I would look good at 225 with a bunch of muscle or maybe like at 185, super lean. I don't know. I well, just want to like what I see in the mirror. You're six foot tall. I would say a, a, a good place to be would probably not 200. forget yet. Yeah, about 200, 200 yeah, two, pounds is a, is a general, you know, area to, to look. So I would say okay. no heavily processed foods, eat mm -hmm. 200 grams of protein a day from whole foods. And let me just start and drink a gallon of water a day. That's it. Don't count anything else you'll probably get leaner just doing that. In fact, I'll bet money that you'll get leaner if you do that consistently, just doing that. Yeah, I think the I think for sure the problem here is you're trying to restrict too hard and then you get that craving because you're, you're, you are hungry, you're low fat, you're low calorie, and then you tend to overswing versus telling you what Sal's saying, which is eat when you're hungry. You Throughout the day, as, as you're going through the day, Eat consistently throughout the day. Just make good choices. Count the protein as your main thing that you're counting and avoid processed foods, but don't try necessarily to restrict really hard. And while you're also strength training, if you're doing that, my guess is you're going to lean out and or build muscle. And if you do it through whole foods and you feed yourself when, correctly when you're hungry and you don't binge because you've restricted really hard, even if you do overconsume calories a little bit here and there, because you're strength training, that'll get prioritized over to building muscle. Yep. So uh, what's killing us is the binge. And the binge right. is probably happening from the hard restriction. Yep. So if we just get out the hard cut and the hard restriction of such low calorie, low fat that you're in right now and feed you what your body probably wants and needs, you're not going to have those tendencies to want to really overeat and consume. And again, like I said, even if you do over consume a little bit, it'll get prioritized over to building muscle if you if we're uh, strength training. Look, look, my dude, look, if you if you did this, okay, if if you ate steak, chicken, eggs rice, potatoes, fruit, vegetables, like whole foods, okay? Whole foods. And you didn't eat out, because that can also mess you up. So you don't eat out. Whole foods. You ate 200 grams of protein a day. So you're like, I got to eat 200 grams of protein a day. And then you just ate until you feel satisfied. That's all you did. And you drank water. That's it. That's all you did. I bet you'd lose 30 pounds alone just from doing that. 30 pounds would come off your body of body fat just from doing that alone. 
And, and of course, you're doing a strength training. You wouldn't have to count or do much else besides just follow those few guidelines right there. And, and you won't feel hungry because you're like, oh, I'm hungry. What am I eat? Okay, well, I can have more steak and, and rice or I can have more chicken and fruit. You know, stick through those foods and you'll the 30 pounds will come off and it won't feel like it's feeling now like you're you're kind of having this battle. I have chicken thighs too. Chicken breasts suck. Yeah. Um, are you following mini maps programs? Well, I bought aesthetics and I bought performance, um, but I haven't trained them yet because I'm with a trainer right now. But as soon as that finishes, I was I was going to start. I'd actually put you on anabolic. Yeah. I, I, I we'll send you over maps anabolic. I'd actually like you to start oh, there. How yeah. often are you with the trainer? Three times a week right now. Oh, you're good. Bro. Does he good, listen to yeah. Mind Pump? I was going to say he can run oh, uh, yeah, the program. That should be okay. Everybody with listening. You. Everybody listening right now. Okay, the show's fucking big enough by now. Okay. If you're hiring a trainer, that should be part of the qualifications. Do you listen to the show? If you don't listen to the show, then find a trainer that does. <laughs> it'll, solve, it'll solve so many problems. He could answer. He could have answered this question better for us because he's heard the show. So yeah, that or use it ask. Is the only mind, way we can verify. Use it. askmindpump.com. Yeah. So there's there you go. But I'm telling you, man, if you just did what I said with those guidelines, and you ate until you were full, okay, so you don't have to worry about trying to eat less or anything like. So I got to eat 200 grams of protein. I'm going to eat whole natural foods. I'm not going to eat out. I'm not going to eat processed foods. I'm going to drink a gallon of water a day. That's it. Every day, you'll you'll lose a lot of body fat from doing that, and you'll feel like you're not dieting. Yeah. A lot less pressure that way, for sure. Right. Well, for me personally, I, I like to track because I feel safe that way. But I got I tracked like at 2,945, and for there, I feel good. I don't feel hungry. I feel like I don't wake up in the middle of the night to eat. But then I was like, I don't know if that's too much. I'm not going to lose weight. No, just- no, that's good. You're good. Yeah. And, and here's the thing. If you really like tracking, okay, I'm not going to, I'm not going to fight you on that either. Like, okay, do it. But then I don't care. I don't care if it's 2,900 one day, 3,200 another day, 27 another day. I don't care. So track it if it makes you feel better. But as your coach and your trainer, I'm telling you to eat how Sal is eating. If it falls on 3,200 calories some days, it falls on, falls on 2,600 calories other days. I don't care. Mm -hmm. That's fine. That's all good. In fact, that's more natural, more sustainable, more realistic to what your life is going to look like in the future when you get to the exact weight body type that you want. You, you're going to have days where you have more surpluses yeah. and days where you have lower. There's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. It should have a natural ebb and flow like that. What we're trying to solve is the binging. And the thing right. that's probably binging is the desire to cut weight and lose faster. Mm -hmm. So you're cutting calories harder than you yeah. should. And then your body wakes you up in the middle of the night and says, fuck you, yeah. feed me. You're working on your palate this and, way. And then you go and, and then you overconsume. So feed yourself yeah. throughout the day as you're hungry. Take the tips that Sal's saying. Don't worry if it hits. I, I don't even care if you have some days, if you're eating through Whole Foods, it's hitting 35, 3,600 calories. The big, as big of a guy as you are who's strength training and moving, okay, who has a day where he hits 3,600 calories, if you lifted weights pretty hard that day or the day before, don't worry. That shit's going to go to building muscle. You're going to be okay. Here, here's what people get confused is that, you, okay, the leaner you get, the more detailed you're going to have to be. Right now, for the next 30 to 40 pounds of body fat, you don't need to be very detailed except for what I said, okay? You don't need to. It's like... It's like you're, you're looking at a mountain, you want to carve it into a, like a detailed statue, and you take a tiny chisel and a little hammer right out the gates. And, and it's like, no, 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 what are you doing? Throw some dynamite at that first. So don't worry about all the tracking and all that, whatever. You're going to get, you'll lose 30, 40 pounds just from doing, now, are you going to get a six pack? Probably not. Once you get down to a certain point and everything's working great. Then we dial in. Then you can start to dial it in, but like literally going to waste your time if you do it. In fact, if you, if you get too dialed right now. If you get too meticulous now, you're going to keep rebounding. You're never going to be able to get out of this this place. And you get frustrated because you're putting the work 100%. in. You're putting so much work yeah. into tracking and, and trying to stay right dialed yeah. to whatever a number That's is it. that you got, a trainer gave you or you gave yourself. Instead, give yourself some freedom and flexibility. Totally. Just avoid eating like an asshole. Eat when you're hungry. Target the protein and train hard. You're going to be it. okay. Okay. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. We got you. You got it, yeah. man. Thanks for All calling right. in, brother. Yeah, man. Take care. You got it. I, I wish people just uh, really got that. The, the human body, there's a huge misconception out there that we're, we evolved to be these mindless eating machines. That's not true. Yeah. The reason why that happens to us is because we're eating food that has been especially designed to make you overeat. Like, good luck. Yeah. Good luck trying to get to a, a, a relatively healthy body weight eating foods that were scientists spent a lot of time 
designing to make you overeat. Now, if you stick to whole natural foods, here's what'll happen. Your body will naturally bring you down to a relatively healthy body weight. Now, it's not going to be 10% body fat, but it's not. It's going to be a lot leaner than what most people walk around at, and it's not going to feel like this crazy uphill battle and struggle. Then when you get down to, for most guys, probably 17 16% body fat, you feel good. You're like, oh, I want to get to 10%. All right, now we can start counting calories and getting more detail, but- most people, you don't need to get all. You don't need to go that far at all. I mean, I feel like it's very obvious to me. This guy's training five to six times a week. He's seen a trainer two, three times a week. Yeah. He's probably pushing pretty hard in the gym. Yep. He's a big dude. He's two hundred seventy pounds, over six foot tall, and he's only given himself twenty four hundred calories. So his body is screaming at him. I want to build muscle. I'm yeah. trying to build muscle, yeah. and he's restricting, restricting because he cares so much about dropping the weight on scale. And then, of course, he probably has a good week or two in a row, and then he breaks. And then he fucking goes way off the rails totally. and goes over, and then that's what gets stuck in this pot too. It's like, man, at this level, to your point, it's like you, you, there's no reason to get that anal about how many calories or grams of protein. It's like hit your protein intake, eat whole foods when you're hungry, train hard. You watch what will happen. Our next caller is Jen from Belgium. Hi, Jen. How can we help you? Hi, guys. Hi. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's uh, past my bedtime here in Belgium, but uh, it's uh, good to be there with you guys. Anyway. Awesome. Thank yeah. you. Um, so I've been listening to you now for a while. Um, I'm a personal trainer and I've pretty much changed my whole program for myself and for my clients because of listening to you guys. So thank you very much for all the advice. It's super helpful and uh, I've seen amazing results and so have my clients. So thanks so much. Awesome. Perfect. All right. So I'm going to read my original question um, and then I'm going to read the follow-up to it because some information has changed. So, um, and then you guys can ask me whatever. Uh, it says, I'm a bikini competitor that has had to drop out of an upcoming competition in October due to not being able to train and pose properly because of a piriformis muscle injury that has caused pain in my hamstring and calf. Um, I've gone to physio and have had le uh, electrotherapy, deep tissue massage, and acupuncture uh, with my therapist, and it's given me some relief, um, but that in addition to significantly lowering my weights and increasing reps when training uh, has helped, but I'm still in a constant pain. Uh, at the time I wrote this, it was not sharp pain, but it was extremely tight pain uh, in my leg, making most movements lower body wise, super painful. Uh, before dropping out of the competition, I had been training with heavy weights and about 10 to 12 reps per set five days a week since last November, uh, except for a peak week uh, this past March for a competition. And my plan for after the competition in October that I'm now not doing was to reverse diet slowly and run anabolic to change things up. Uh, so I purchased anabolic already in anticipation of this. But however, now that I am not doing the competition, I thought to start uh, anabolic now and even contacted your team about running it with this uh, injury. Uh, I was advised to run Prime Pro with it, uh, which is great advice and I'm happy to do it. But my question is, if I run anabolic with lower weight and higher reps uh, at this point in my training with now coming off of the injury, uh, is that ideal? Um, and also, if you have any advice for strengthening the piriformis anyway, that would be helpful. Um, and so the follow up is that since I said submitted the question, um, I was diagnosed with two lower herniated discs, and that was where the pain, the pain in my leg originated from. Um, so for about two weeks, I was doing nothing at all, no upper, no lower, no nothing. And since then I've been doing light band work. Um, and then yesterday was my first day back at the gym and I restarted anabolic. Uh, but I was, I could only squat mostly not necessarily because of pain. I'm not in pain anymore, but mostly because I'm kind of terrified of triggering it again. Uh, I squatted 30 kilos and only benched 30. Um, and then for deadlifts, uh, sorry, this was uh, on Monday. And then for deadlifts today, I did um, RDLs with dumbbells. And I think that was maybe 32 kilo total. Um, so basically, I don't know if anabolic is the right program at this point. I don't know kind of where to go with this because I'm, I want to lift heavy again. I want to compete again, but I'm pretty terrified of going too fast um, and too heavy too fast. So I wanted to know if you guys have any uh, suggestions of where to go. I don't think it's 
the wrong program, but I do think we have better programs for where you're currently at. Symmetry is where I'd have you. And then okay. after that, I would actually put you in something like performance. Uh, what happens a lot of times with my competitors or strength athletes, we train so much in the sagittal plane um, and we neglect uh, sometimes core training. So core and multi-planar movements, I think would be extremely beneficial to you, which is addressed in MAPS performance. And then also mobility, I think, is going to uh, help you. So okay. to me, if I had to recommend a, a program order, it would be symmetry and performance. I'd like to hear if the guys agree or disagree. You know, I'm glad you gave me the update, yeah. Jen, because you were you initially you were talking about it being a piriformis injury, but it didn't sound like piriformis at all because it went down your leg. Um, in fact, I was going to ask you if you had any low back injuries because it sounded nerve, nerve yeah. related. Uh, do you know do you, where are the where are the discs that are her herniated? Uh, it's between L4 and L5, and then um, apparently a much older one, uh, L5, S1. Oh, yeah. Okay. Do we know how much? Yeah. Oh. So, uh, I mean, yeah, that's – so you had – you had to hurt, the disc was pushing on the nerve, and that was causing that kind of pain. Do you have any weakness on one side, or is that all better now? Uh, yeah, actually, a couple years ago, actually, I fell down the steps, and since then, it's been that my whole left side has been a mess of trying to mm – -hmm. I mean, you can – not now, but I could literally look in the mirror and see where my shoulder was, you know, really high. Uh, my hip is kind of off. So I've been doing therapy for it all. But I don't know if that contributed to possibly the injury being on that side um, with this whole situation. But right now I have no pain. Um, and I, with the two workouts that I've done that were both anabolic, I really went slow and I focused and I made sure my hips were in line and that sort of thing. And I, didn't have any issues doing the workouts. Um, but like I said, it was super okay. low weight. And that's the, that's the injury that you think that caused it the fall. I think since then, I'm not, I mean, I'm a little older since it happened, so maybe that's it. But, uh, you know, I think it's everything kind of started then I dislocated yeah. the bones in my foot during the fall yeah. after that. That's what it was. Yeah. But Okay, so I'm going to give you some good news, Jen. If I were to take, uh, you know, I don't know, 100 people and scan them, you would see a lot of herniated discs with no symptoms, and you'd see a lot of discs that look fine with symptoms. Okay. Uh, so the good news here is that um, this is not a death sentence at all. Uh, it probably did change some of your recruitment patterns. You look very fit. Mm. You compete. So you're probably really strong, or you, you can be pretty strong for your, for your size. This is where adding load on the bar doesn't make any more sense. Really what you want to do is you want to be able to add load without adding load. What I mean by that is slow the reps down, make the pot, maybe do a pause rep, increase the intensity, right? So let's say for example, you're squatting with a hundred pounds on your back and you're like, I could add 30 pounds to the bar and do 10 reps. Well, what I would rather have you do is do a hundred pounds, but make the 10 reps feel like you have 130 pounds on your bar on the bar by changing the tempo mm -hmm. and making the exercise feel more challenging. You're going to get more benefit out of that at your level than you will by just trying to get stronger. Now, if you're a beginner, I'd say just get stronger. But right, this is where you're going to get your benefit now is from making the exercises feel heavier and harder versus can I do more reps and can I add more weight? Yeah, and address these imbalances, really. I mean, take the time to uh, go through and build new patterns. And, and I think that because of that uh, acute kind of injury, it's it it, it 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 did kind of shift in, in terms of priorities of how the body's trying to stabilize and organize itself. Uh, and so to Adam's original advice, I do see like value in, in symmetry and the, especially the first phase is really like isometrically driven. Uh, and putting you in these positions and split stance positions and different positions for you to really, you know, hone into um, being able to be stabilized in and be able to produce force in those. Uh, and then unilaterally, now we're addressing a lot of those imbalances and trying to correct them with strength. So uh, I think in that sort of um, timeline and, and going through symmetry, then eventually we're going to get to more um, different types of planes of movement too, I do think are very valuable moving laterally and rotating, uh, uh, that if that hasn't been part of your programming at all, is going to have massive value in terms of like keeping you pain-free and strong. Yeah. I, go map symmetry, 
Start the exercises with your left side. That's your weaker side, right? Okay. Let the left side dictate how many reps and what the weight is for the right side. And from now moving forward, just because of your fitness level, because of uh, your experience, I, I wouldn't worry anymore about necessarily getting stronger. The approach I would have is, can I make this feel heavier with my technique and my form? Can I do okay. it that way? Because the risk versus reward ratio when you just get started is amazing to get stronger. As you get stronger, though, the, it starts to shift. Like it stops making sense to keep trying to add weight to the bar at some point. I mean, you can do it, but the risk to, to reward ratio is so crappy that it's like, why do it? Unless you're going to compete in powerlifting and that's your life passion, I would say your your approach with all strength training from this point, and this is just because again, because you're so fit already, and you've been in, you've got great experience. I would every time I work out, it's like, can I make this feel heavier? Can I make this feel harder? Can I feel it more in the target muscle? Can I be more perfect and controlled with my repetitions? That's gonna that's gonna lead you so well, regardless of what program you follow. But I do like map symmetry though because. It's so focused on balancing out right to left. I think you'll get a lot of value out of that. I think if you were a client of mine or a friend, I would actually try and discourage you from competing anytime soon in the next year or two and really yeah. encourage you to, um, you know, the same the, with the same type of discipline and attitude that you have towards being a bikini competitor, because obviously we can see that you've you've been successful at doing that. I would actually like get into these movements that we have in performance uh, after you get through symmetry. So symmetry is really trying to really phase two. Right? Yeah, yeah. Right. So symmetry first is the foundation. We need to do that right now for you to try and balance out what we possibly can address some issues. Performance now starts moving into these kind of unique movements that as a bikini competitor, you're probably going to be unfamiliar with. And then I would, as if I was your coach, as we're going through it, I would try and take that bikini competitor obsession to those movements. Like, let's get perfect at this movement. Let's get really good at this exercise and, and, and get that hyper focus that you know I know that you have and put it into things like that that I know that are going to bulletproof your body and benefit you long term. That would be my selfish uh you know recommendation if uh you were a friend or a client is right. I, I would move you away from competitor competing right now and it doesn't mean forever we could potentially right. revisit that but where where you're at right now in your body the level you're at that's like sal's pointing out uh i don't think you need to get any more shredded or focus on those things like we need to bulletproof this body and take care of that for for longevity so you're able to lift weights all the way till you're 90 years old yeah, so. and, you, and you'll actually get great you'll get better results that way that's right with development and shape and aesthetics anyway and just to be clear this mm -hmm. doesn't mean avoid low reps people think when i say this oh i can't go low reps anymore no no, no. you can do sets of five yeah. it's just you're picking a weight that you can do 10 with and then you're making five feel heavy with your technique it's all about the intent mm -hmm. with the lift is because you know this uh, you've been working out you, you know like i said you're fit I bet you you could take a weight that you could do 15 reps with right. and make it feel hard at 10 reps just by the way you do it and how you Time focus on tension. it. That's it. So that's the mentality because you keep trying to get stronger at this point. I mean, you could do it. I just don't think you're going to get the reward that you would get uh, out of it, out of what I'm saying. Out of what I'm saying, I think we'll get more reward out of it. Right. Uh, does that also count, do you think, if right now I'm in a kind of a mini cut because I was previously bulking, um, and so then once I stopped with the goal of the competition, I was like, well, some of this has to go. So I'm kind of in a mini cut now with the thought that maybe in a month I would do the reverse diet out. And, uh, once I got to maintenance, then go over a couple hundred calories, uh, yep. and kind of push it. Um, so when I start to bulk, do I still stick to this plan? Always. Assuming? Yeah. Always. This All is right. the mentality you should, yeah. you should follow yeah, yeah. Uh, working out from now on. Yeah. Bulk or cut. Doesn't yeah. Matter. It doesn't matter. By the yeah. way, you, you look super lean. What yeah. are you cutting? What do you, what's your body fat at? Cause you said you're going to cut. What are you at right now? I have no idea at this point because it's like survival mode kind yeah. of after everything's happened. I'm just like, I just want to fit in my pants. I mean, I would probably throw you in a maintenance phase. I would put now. you maintenance or bolt. Just from what I'm looking at yeah. right now, you don't look like I need to cut you or lean you out at all. So I would, again, being selfish and telling you what I want, I would say, let's get right to a good calorie place and just main maintenance calories. Totally. Let's have you fed. I bet you're in the high teens at the most body fat percentage. And I, I would, I would have you, I would want you to hover around 20 
percent body fat. Okay. That's where you're going to get the best results across the board. Yeah. Before I started cutting, I think I was at the highest was like 2,300 calories and, um, barely put on any weight with it. So, yeah, I mean, I probably could have gone longer at that if not higher. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Let's feed. Yeah. You. Stop the cut. Let's, yeah. let's, let's go on a little more of a bulk maintenance type of deal. Okay, cool. All right. Thanks for calling in. Yeah. Jen. All right, Jen. Thank you. We'll send you map symmetry. We're yeah. gonna send you those programs, right. by and, the way. If and you follow back up with us. Would love to hear how you're feeling after you've gone through symmetry. So circle back to us. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much, guys. You guys are amazing. You All got right, it. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. You know, it's like uh, at some point, adding weight to the bar, you make it feel heavier. You're gonna yeah. get way better results across the board. And she's obviously fit. She's been doing this for a little while. Like uh, such a longevity hack too. I mean, or I mean, it's it's a hack for anybody. But it is. I mean, you know, at a certain point, like if if you're you're just not moving the needle forward, or if you have like something that you're recovering from, especially, mm -hmm. you can, there's a lot you can do to to increase, um, you know, um, what kind of stress you're, you're placing on your body without actually like having the the risk go up. That's right. Yeah, when you're focused on aesthetic so much it's really easy to neglect some of these other movements that are just so they're important also, to you. yeah, yeah they're, they're so important to you at at all ages and stages of life but even more so as we get older and and and, and, and or the and, more advanced you get and the more advanced yeah. we are uh because it does it it's a higher the higher risk with the, your ability to push and move more weight and so and I can just tell she's already in incredible shape already. And if she, we're already starting to see these issues and she's had this been diagnosed with stuff like uh, to me, I'm like, you let's not even think about that stuff now. Let's get really good at, and I bet she hasn't done things like a, you know, multi-planar lunge or a windmill or a Turkish exactly. get up or like, exactly. these are a lot of great exercises that, um, you know, that would really benefit her to get good at just bolsters the body. Yeah. Completely. And so I would, I would, and to Sal's, uh, you know, adding to my point with that is, and she'll probably end up looking really great That's too. It. You know what I'm saying? Like, cause That's she's got a solid foundation. So doing a novel stimulus like that while yeah. she's fed she's gonna actually yeah. see probably great aesthetic results i'm glad too, too she gave us the update because she said performance and she was explaining the symptoms i'm like oh, yeah, yeah, sound yeah. like performance right. it sounds like something from your back look if you like mind pump head over to mindpumpfree.com and download all of our free fitness guides you can also find all of us on instagram justin is at mind pump justin i'm at mind pump to stefano and adam is at mind pump adam 